What's up with you on the Legion? What up, this is Joyce Bell here on the Belize and the Bell Show. Make sure you check us out on the Woodward Sports Network. What's up, Belegian and Bell? Tuesday morning here at the Lady Jane Studio. Joy Bell, Sean Belegian. What's up, Joy? What up, though? We got a we got a busy show today, man. We do. I you know what? I love this time of year because, like, as a nerd, and and I'm a nerd. I openly admit it. I have no problem saying it. Um, you get the football happening this weekend, right? But you get so much draft talk as well, and. That's one of the things we're going to be doing today. My boy, uh, Scott Bischoff, is going to be coming in. He's been covering the, the draft, scouting the draft uh, for years. He's going to be coming in live. And we got a special guest to talk yeah, about. It's like our featured game this week, right? I, I'm, I'm just calling it the Bell Bowl. It's just the Bell Bowl, right? I'm calling it that. All right, let's I'm roll call, with it. I'm calling, I'm calling it that. And um, it didn't really dawn on me until you brought it up. And so... Um, since you came up with the name, you want to tell people what the Bell Bowl is? Let's do it. All right. It's New Orleans and Chicago, two places that, that the man spent some time. Spent you some love time. New Orleans, too, I right? I did. I did. I did. Yeah. I love, and I actually, I, I love Chicago, too. I did. I love Chicago. Yeah, but um, as far as, I, I love the city of New Orleans. It's, it's, it's a different vibe. Totally. Uh, it's, a, it's a totally different totally. vibe. Loved it. Uh, spent a lot of time in um, the French Quarter. All right, down Canal Street, a lot of shopping there. Oh yeah, Team Hotel was right across the street from, um, right across the street from like everything. Yeah. And so it was, it, it was good times. Good. People there are friendly, you love the people, great food. Um, you can't go wrong in New Orleans. The Creole, you give me some Cajun, you give me some Creole. That's like, don't get me started. I'm yeah. not going to start on food. And speaking of New Orleans, we have a player from New Orleans joining us today, actually. Yeah, Janoris Jenkins gonna gonna join us. Uh, Jack Rabbit. Jack Rabbit. You gotta and ask him about Jack Rabbit. I'm gonna ask him how he got that nickname. I have it's a rumor going going around. I'm gonna ask him if, if it's true or not. Um, but stay tuned. He'll be coming on within the next um, hour or so. Yeah, so. about uh, when I'm okay. being told about twelve fifteen. Yeah, about 12, uh, we expect to hear from Janoris Jenkins. Pretty cool. The week of a playoff game, you get uh, a chance to talk to a guy that's going to be playing a uh, critical role in that game. You know, Joy. Here, here's a what's a playoff week like. I mean, you you went through a playoff week. Yeah. What, what's a playoff week like? It's like a regular week. Yeah. Nothing yeah, different. Nothing different. I mean, if something's been working all season long, you don't get to the playoffs and, and switch it up. You just don't. So same same as always, you report back in today to go over Sunday's game. Tuesday's off. You come back in Wednesday. You go through the um, the personnel, uh, the depth chart, and then you kind of move forward after the team meeting. So you treat it like a regular week. You know what's so funny? I, I hear this. I hear people say this all the time, and I'm, I'm going to use your college coach as an example, Paul Winters. Uh, shout out to P Dubs. Um, they're creatures of habit. They don't like deviation. So I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised to hear you say that. Yeah. You know, hey guys, business as usual. We we all know the stakes are higher. We don't have to have a team meeting talking about it or anything like that. Just stay the course, huh? Just stay the course. Love Just, it. Uh, stay the course and. Uh, I don't. Th I just don't see a team like uh, that. You are who you are, right? You the same thing you've been doing all season. You're not going to switch it up just because you're going to the playoffs. Um, because the last thing you want to happen is to switch something up. And um, you know, I'm not going to say rituals, but mm -hmm. we are a routine. This is a routine game, and so you want to stick to that same routine uh, week in, week out. And so uh, I don't. It, there's no big changes at all. Uh, lots of people saying good morning, Brandon, Jenna, Lynn, Scott, Greg. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Scott said, Joik, what city had the best food that you played in? I, I like I like the random questions, especially yeah. Scott. When you come back to the F word, so are we talking about the 
the food at the facility or are we talking about the food in the city? I'm guessing the city itself. Which, which city had the most flavor? Um, the city, I would say New Orleans. Yeah. Um, Buffalo was a close second as far as the city. Um, if we're talking about teams, like having team meals, mm -hmm. New Orleans used to have this thing on Friday. It was like a barbecue Friday, and they had this, they would carry out this company, and they would come in every Friday. And we have like they have the smoker, the grill out, like oh. out, and so they're grilling, like. And uh, I was never a big fan of, of oysters, but they had these grill Rockefeller oysters, and it with the char on it, and they had like all these different cheeses on top that kind of melted into it, and it didn't taste like that oozy. It wasn't like that, and so I actually enjoyed those. Um, the only ones I've ever enjoyed. Um, and then as far as teams, calf, the Bears. Yeah. Oh, uh, it was, it was. <laughs> I mean, they had the, um, <laughs> the BOP, 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 bop. So if anyone's seen that new Kevin Hart special, yeah. they had the bop. So the, the um, what's you call it? The um, brick oven pizza. Um, and so they just put it in, a, uh, they put it in and, you know, whatever you want on it. Um, they had uh, uh, fresh smoothies every single morning uh, to your liking, whatever you want. Had a fresh, fresh squeezed orange juice every morning. Um, state of the art chef, where they you come in, this is what I want. Fresh everything, organic. They, I mean, it was um, it, it, it was over the top. Great. All right, it was over the top. And so I would say as far as team, I would say the Bears. You know, I know we're not allowed to say this in Detroit, but I have no problem saying it. I know you said it earlier, too. I love Chicago. It's a great city. Yeah, I love I, give me Chicago over New York or L.A. any day. There's just there's too much going on in those big cities for me. There's just too much going on, man. I, I don't like the big city. I don't want to say all that, but I like <laughs> Chicago. Uh, Chicago over New York for me because I, I just, you know, I haven't been in New York long enough to kind of to get around. Yeah. Um, and so, but I, I I just have more of a – I gravitate more towards Chicago than New York, but I'll choose L.A., I like LA over Chicago. Always like to give Grammy Whammy a shout out. Good Grammy morning, Whammy. Grammy Whammy. <laughs> she me Every, everybody last always night. says hi to Grammy Whammy. Yeah, Grammy Whammy. So she texted me last night and said, um, I, you know, I don't get to see you as often anymore, but now uh, she said, when he do it, I can see you two hours every single day. <laughs> you know, and somebody's dissing your sweater as well. Kenny said, someone tell Joyke, ugly Christmas sweater season is over. All right, so let me I tell- like that jam. Yeah, so it's, first of all, it's Eastside Golf. So it's okay. a group of young men who started a, a golf company um, letting African-American young males know that it's okay to golf. And they reached out to me and asked me if you know if they could send me a sweater, and they sent me this one. And so I'm kind of I'm supporting I'm supporting black businesses in the area. Way so, to go! Yeah, and so and so that's why I'm wearing this sweater today because I'm a golfer. I like to golf, and I wanted to support um, the young man who came up with this idea. I actually met him at a golf outing, and um, uh, actually a really good golfer too. He's probably like a two handicap. So I was like, okay, well you golf a little bit too. I'll support it. I'll support it. I'll wear the sweater, sweatshirt. I send it over. And so uh, I'm wearing it. Lots of uh, Lion head coach prospect news. Uh, the Lions are going to bring in the Dearborn native. Yeah. And, and I think if you ask the people out there, uh, Robert Sala seems to be the guy that most people are saying. Joyke, I don't care what anybody says, and I've heard you say it, and I I've heard guys that come here say it. Detroit is like a Detroit centric city. It just is. Okay. And, you know, even in the business, there's a reason why a lot of national shows don't work here because Detroiters want to hear about Detroit. Yep. They want to talk about Detroit and, and they want people that, that are Detroit. And that, that's something that, that is very unique to this area. And I think when you're bringing in a guy that, that is going to, not only be the head of your football team, but hopefully be the face, the man that gets this franchise turned around the corner. To me, who better than a guy that gets it? He gets what the fans have gone through. He gets what this area is. Yeah. I, you know what? There, there might be a better fit here or there. To me, this guy's a perfect fit where this team is at right now. Okay, yeah. you know what? We might be transitioning soon. But here's a guy that gets his franchise and knows what people want around here. Uh, yeah, I like him. He, well, he's not my first option. 
And the thing I like about him is that he is from the area. Mm-hmm. And he has some experience with coaching. But if I had to choose out the people that we have so far, the people, I'm not going to say choose, but the guy that I like so far, it will probably be um, um, Eric Benemy. Mm-hmm. That's who I like. Um, he's played in the NFL. He's coached at the college level. He's coached at the NFL level. He's been a running back coach where he coached some of the best running backs in the league with Adrian Peterson, those guys. Um, even when the Chiefs weren't doing too hot, the run game was still – He was still, they were still having a decent run game. Uh, uh, I like him. I like him. So, I like Eric Bieniemy a lot. Yeah. And I'm old enough to remember what a great – and I use that word great. He was a great running back at Colorado. Yeah. He was part of that resurgence of Colorado. Yeah. It was kind of fun to watch. Uh, was up for the Heisman Trophy. Yep. Um, he knows what it takes. Um, he's been a part of he, he's been a part of this winning organization for quite some time. He's been this since what 2013, um, and he's still there now as an OC since 2018. Um, so he's in that room with Andy Reid. Going, you know, he's part of coming up with those plays. It's not just Andy Reid, and I give a lot of kudos to Andy Reid. But he's in those rooms and he's putting in his two cents. And so I think that's that's what we need here. Yeah. I think if we are looking, I don't even I think we interview Marvin Lewis, but I don't think he's in I don't think he's in the picture. Um, but we have to look at every option. Amen. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, do your due diligence. I interview everybody. I yeah. mean, it just just do it. The way it's going, I might go in for an interview. Shoot. Get in there. You and Herman? <laughs> I, I saw Herman tweet something out. Shout out to Herman Moore. You know, here's the thing with Eric Bieniemy. Do you know what I'm worried about in regards to Eric Bieniemy and why I, I don't think that this place might be a fit for him? is the uncertainty of where things are going with your quarterback. We still don't know. Do I want Matthew Stafford here? Absolutely I do, okay? But, you know, if you read if you read some of the articles and, and you read some of the chatter that's out there, and it's funny because I read an article, ESPN did a coaching carousel article the other day, and they, they kind of um, took each perspective head coach and, and talked about where they might fit. And, Joyke, I thought they made a really good point. If, if Eric Bieniemy knew that Matthew Stafford was going to be here for the next five years, you know, that's something different because you're not walking into a better situation. You're just not. Right. Matthew Stafford is better right now than the young quarterbacks in this league, simply put. Right. But I, that, it was interesting because the author said, is that something that might kind of scare Eric Bieniemy away? Is a general manager going to come in and say, you know what, we want to make the transition soon and everything. I thought it was a good point. In theory, if the Lions come into next season, even with what they have this year, mm-hmm. I want I want Eric Bieniemy. Yeah, so they, they, they got to get that offense going, man. Yeah. So hmm, I don't think the offense was the biggest issue this year. Not at all. Not at all. Not I don't. I don't all. think. I don't think it was the big issue. Um, I think we need to bring him in. We need to have this conversation. Um, let him know what we're what we're leaning towards. Let's see what his head is at. Let's see what his philosophy or what his vision is. And let's see what the GM vision is. And then we go from there. I don't think we say, oh, he's not going to come here because Stafford's not going to be here. I don't think that's what – I don't think that's the angle we should take. It should be – it should be we come in, let's sit down, what's out there. Um, Stafford's not playing bad. He's not playing bad. Not at he, all. No, he's not playing bad. Not at all. He's playing good. Like, he's playing some of his best football now. And so, I say we bring him in, um, let him talk with Stafford. I was I think he uh, he has that right now as a player to be able to sit down with the people that they might be bringing in if he's going to be part of his organization in the, you, in the future. You know, you bring up such a good point, and, and this is I want to take a screwdriver to it and tighten the screws because I don't want one person out there to think that I'm putting the blame for what ails the Lions on the offense. Far from it. The problem on the defensive side of the ball is they don't have talent. I mean, there are a couple pieces. They need to completely revamp that, that yeah. defense. So to me – I think what you need to do is you need to bring a guy in here that's going to make this an explosive offense to kind of make up for some of the shortcomings of the defense. You know what I mean? Because right. I think Kansas City's got a little bit of that going on. That's not a great Kansas City defense. No, by it's any not. Stretch. It's not. So, you know, and you know as well as I do, we talked about it yesterday. We talked about it yesterday. I got to get used to these mics. Sorry about that. Adam, thanks for that. Um, this is this is an offensive game. They're punishing the Bill Bentleys of the world. They're punishing guys on defense now. So to me, until you get the talent on the defensive side, they punishing side of the Bill Bentley. 
Yeah, they are punishing the Bill Bentleys of the world. You know that. Bill Bentley. What's up, Bill? You're getting punished, Bill. Well, you know, all, I, I, all these defensive guys know it. I mean, the way they call the game, it's a freaking joke. But, um, no, I mean, joint to that point, to me, it's like I want to kick that offense up where, quite frankly, they have to go out there and they outscore people. Like, like, they look, do. Look, look what Alabama's doing right now, like in college football. Nick Saban flat out said, look, the, the future is offense. Let's just be honest. I mean, that, that's what's going on. So he's got a defense that isn't up to normal Alabama standards. So what has he got? He's got a prolific, I almost swore, prolific offense. You know, that, that's just saying, you might score 46, Florida, but we're going to score 52. No, we're going to score 61. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. Lots of comments. Um, uh, by the way, somebody asked, Joyke, would you put me on staff? I wouldn't. I, I told you, you know what my defensive mindset is? Send them. You said, you said what I what? Would you put me on staff? Like, if you, if you get hired with the Lions, would you put me on staff? I wouldn't. Because <laughs> uh, I'd call defensive plays. Every play would be send them. I mean, <laughs> I'd be the worst. Send them. We Coach, a, <laughs> it's fourth and one. Send we, them. So when I played, so I was in high school, we had this um, play. We called it 5-3 Dirty Dog. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, the color 5-3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and whenever he gave me that, I was so excited because I could just blitz, no responsibility, just get to the ball. Right. I loved it. That's I loved it. And so I Maybe was able to. like me. Yeah, I, I used to love it. And so uh, I wasn't minded in certain situations. In certain uh, situations. A couple questions. Steve said, I'm with you. Uh, Rod Wood addressed that question from Dave Perquette this morning, had a decent response. I don't have a link to the interview, but it should be on the Lions Facebook page. I would bring, I would be uh, intrigued about that. Scott said, can Sala bring four first round picks on the defensive line with him? The defense was 17th in scoring this year when injuries happened to that line. Uh, you need like like you need a complete revamp of the defense. There's no other way to say it. I mean, it, and that's something that it, this isn't going to happen overnight. I mean, are, could they be better next year? Absolutely. I I think just by changing the scheme alone, they can be better. But you need a talent upgrade on that defense. Okay. I, I'm not I'm not being disrespectful. That was a historically bad defense. It was. I'm thinking we finished last in defense this year. Yeah. We did. It's just absolutely disgusting. So we're not we're not down in our lives now. I'm a no. I'm a lion heart out. You know? No. We're diehard fans. But look at the numbers, man. We finished last on defense. Uh it was it was bad this year. It was it, bad. It was um it was depressing. It was and I'm with you. I mean I, I've always said, you know, for years because Joyke on my side, you get people saying well, you're being too negative. Well, well, what am I supposed to say about that defense? Find, find the silver lining in that. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, think, I think, one, you have to do your job. And I'm not going to sit here and say, well, the defense wasn't that bad when it was historically bad, when it gave up more yards than it ever had, when it gave up the second most points ever and, and more points than any other Lion team, including the 2008. And, and I think the most depressing part to me is, look, I'm not, I'm not afraid to call myself out. There are guys on that defense – that I thought were going to work, that aren't working, yeah. you know? And I'll be the first guy to say it. I mean, there are guys like that aren't Jared Davis. It's, it's just not happening. It's not. And as we talked about yesterday, maybe it's the way they use him. Maybe they should use him in your 5-3, right? Maybe they should use him. <laughs> and I, I, I did the little, the little run Maybe they should use him in a 5-3 because, uh, Joy, I, I'm going to say it again, and, uh, you know, Scott Bischoff is going to be in, in a few, and, and he'll talk about it. He looks like a guy chase a dog chasing cars half the time. I mean, he, he almost like, all right, I think I'm supposed to go here. I think I'm supposed to go there. The drive is there. The physicality is there. The work ethic is there. I got mad respect for that dude because every year you've watched him you know what just they say. buffer and buffer, but it's not working on the field. You know, you know what they say. What's that? If you make a mistake, make it going 100 miles per hour. Yeah. Make it going 100 miles per hour. That's exactly what it is. Uh, and um, and when you're out there, and, and when it's a talent standpoint, you just want your team to, to have, like, show some type of effort. And I think he shows that. I think he just needs to be put in better positions. I don't know if he's not being put in the right positions. I don't know what his readers are. Uh, but once again, what type of leadership do they have in the room? Who's showing him the ropes? Who's teaching him how to study? Like, who's showing him these things? Uh, when I came to the league, I had Fred Jackson. Um, I love Fred. I had Fred. I love Fred. Fred gave me a lot of tips that I took with me to other teams. And um, I remember when I left Buffalo and I went to um, Philly, 
uh, I would get in the cold tub every day, every single day. Um, because Fred Jackson said, yeah, you want to add years in your career? Get in the cold tub after every single practice. I said, okay, all right. If you say I need to do this, you've been in the league long enough to know I'm going to take your word for it. I'm not going to argue. I'm in the cold tub every day after practice. I, I leave, I go to Philly. I'm in the cold tub every day after practice. The only rookie that's doing it every, after every single practice. And Mike Vick, after like a week and a half, two weeks of seeing me in there every single day, and he would never call me Joy. He would call me Joy Bell. Hey, Joy Bell, why, why are you in here every day? Why, why, are you, why, why are you in here every day? Like you're a veteran or something. Like, why are you in? I said, a veteran told me that if I get here every day, it will add years of my career. That's what I told him. Yeah. And he looked at me. He shook his head. He said, I wish the vet would have told me that when I, was, when I, when I came in. Amen. I said, I must be on the right track. Amen. I might be on the right track. And so it's guys like that in the locker room that can help guys like me who's coming in to teach me how to be a pro. Who was there to teach, you know, Jared to be a pro? Legitimate point. Jelani Tavai looks lost, too. I mean, he, he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't hey, have there's some uh, breaking news coming out of the Browns camp. Uh, head coach, also two other coaches and two players have COVID issues. Uh, oh, that's coming geez. from ESPN. So breaking news on that. Oh, jeez. Jeez. This is going to be a, coming the most horrible time. You don't uh, know who to play. They didn't release the Of players. all the franchises, too, the Browns. The Browns. Like the, those Can't Browns catch a break. We're finally, we're finally having this year. We put together this nice year. We get a chance to knock off the freaking Steelers in the playoffs, and you got this creeping in? Holy crap, what a disaster this could be for the NFL, by the way. Did they break, is there anything about them breaking por- protocol? Allegedly, some players were partying. Yeah, there was uh, partying involved, so the head coach... Uh, has COVID issues. Two other coaches and some players as well now too. Oh, so it seems like it's uh, seems like it's spreading. This is this. Oh my gosh! And young players. Well, and you know what, Joy? At the end of the day, now you it, you you. I know the NFL has proven that they want to be a hard ass to show you a lesson. They did it to Denver. Remember, Denver basically had to start me as a quarterback. They did it to the Lions. Where, you know, oh, I don't care if your coach is there. We're playing this game. It doesn't matter. How do you do this for the playoffs, man? No. And uh, this is what meant, like, we just went through this. A player literally just got kicked off the team, sent home, a first-round draft pick for going out and party and breaking team protocol, NFL protocol, um, dealing with COVID. And then you have a team that just made it to the playoffs who has an opportunity to do something that had to go on a run. I'm not saying they might not win at, win at all, but they have an opportunity to go on a run. And you have guys going out and partying and then bringing this back to your team. How selfish is that? Where are the leaders? Who's in that locker room? Because if one person's going out on a team, he's telling other players. The player, all the players know. All, they, they know who's going out and partying. Well, where are the leaders in the locker room saying, no, 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 this is not the time for that. We haven't accomplished our goal yet. And this, and this is the culture that we don't need to have here. Preach. All right? We don't need to have that culture here in Detroit to make it to the playoffs and think we made it. Why are you partying? You just got here. Why do you think that happens so much in other organizations like the NFL? Because you have young guys who don't think. They don't think. They have no discipline when it comes to, well, I want to have fun. Nothing's going to happen to me. I'll be all right. I'll be okay. It's ridiculous. What you see, what's funny? What's McCarty, funny? McCarty chimed in uh, because you know you're preaching to him as a former athlete. He said, culture, culture, <laughs> culture. F-U-R. And F-U-R. F-U-R. <laughs> <laughs> we My need Darren gra- McCarty as the, as the I DC. I love you, Darren. Yeah. You know what? Well, He'll he'll uh, he'll make the the opposition turtle, no doubt about that. Uh, somebody said he asked a couple times, so I'm going to get to this. We touched on it yesterday. Yeah. Eric said, "How about the bad calls from Sunday? Jones get a touchdown or not? It was one thousand percent a touchdown." I'm going to tell you this: one thousand percent a touchdown. This is what they could have did to avoid this from happening. Every team that made it into the playoffs, right? They should have had already had some type of setup for a bubble for those teams. Uh-huh. Couldn't agree more. This, already this been, is the most important time, absolutely. And now stuff like this won't happen. 
and I'm not blaming it on the NFL because this is not the NFL problem, but it's going to be their problem in their pockets because now what's the next move, right? Now they can just penalize Cleveland and say, hey, you guys just have to play with the players that don't have it. Whole team has to get tested. I don't know how they're going to do it, but. I don't think the NHL and NBA get enough credit for the way they ran that. You know, I, I re- and I always, and I, I always joke, the NHL is, is usually the franchise that takes the gun from the holster, puts out its foot and shoots itself in the foot. For the NHL to kind of lead the way and get the ball rolling, I, I was stunned. I mean, I bravo. And, and as a hockey fan first, I, I'm surprised to say that because they usually screw things up. There's no so how many players on the roster for the NHL? Uh, 20, 25, but when you're talking, you, there are going to be some guys sitting and everything, and um, you know they're, they're going to be guys not dressing for each game. But they got in that bubble, and they stayed in that bubble away from everybody until they were eliminated. It, yeah. was, it was beautiful. In the NBA, it was 12? Yeah. 12? Yeah. And so you got to think, you got 25 guys you have to account for. NBA is 12 guys. In the NFL, you're going to have 63 guys that you have to account for. You know, uh, and I think it might be more than that now. Um, but, like, you have 53 guys on the active roster. Then you also have the practice squad guys. And so you, you're you're taking care of about 65 to 70 players. And you have to find hotels. You got to find a big so – that's, now, that's tough. But it's doable. It, considering. And you know what, Joik? Not in the regular season, but to your point, this is the money time. This is the playoffs. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that you do this during the regular season, but you are 100% on point. You tell those guys as soon as that game ends on Sunday. Guess what, boys? We're going in the damn bubble. We're we're all going in the bubble, and and, and that's the way it is. I couldn't agree more, man. Couldn't you just increase fines? Couldn't you increase suspensions? That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What? What? Find them what? How much are you going to find them? I just feel like there has to be a better process because when you look at the NBA. You're going to find them a game check? You're going to find them. You got people getting a million dollars a game. You're going to find them a hundred thousand. That's ten. You know, if I make a hundred dollars and I want to go out and have a good time, I'll pay ten dollars. So then what about suspensions? Suspending. I mean, could you imagine being suspended? Who's who's suspending their top player? Who's going to suspend a Jarvis Landry? That's true. Yeah. Who's going to suspend him going into the playoffs? Yeah. Baker, you're not starting. We're, we're, going, we're going into Pittsburgh. Baker, you're not starting. You want to yeah, we're going a different route. We're not starting. We're not leaving. Yeah. No, you just eliminate all of that. And that's why the NFL is the only professional sport that has freaking curfews when they go on away games and home games. The only, only professional sport. NBA, they don't treat them like kids. NHL, no curfew. NFL, curfew in your room by 10 o'clock. Some coaches, right, D Mac? Scott, <laughs> Scotty was always looking over over your shoulder. Coming to your coming to your room, having bad checks like we're children. Yeah. Because situations like this. You know. No, you nailed it. I mean, just incredibly selfish. You know, can you imagine? Like, I want you. Let's take the name out of it. Cleveland Browns. Let's insert the name Detroit Lions. Could you imagine the Lions had the type of season that the Browns did? They go 11 and 5. Joyk, it's 2014. It's 2014. The Lions go 11 and 5, and you hear about this shit happening before you go play a playoff game? No, I'll tell you People this. People around here lose it. Absolutely lose it. Well, I'll tell you this. There would be riots. <laughs> I'll tell you this. We had a situation before when I played, all right? And it didn't affect, but it didn't affect us, right? But it did. So we, uh, we're playing in London. We're playing in London, and um, it was our first time going to London, and we were playing the Falcons. I don't know if you remember that game, but we were playing the Falcons. And um, they had to stand out in the country about 45 minutes to an hour outside of London. And on Friday, they took us from the country and they put us downtown London uh, on that Friday night, on that Friday night, and we had to walk through we had the um, we had the walkthrough. We had the um, the meetings, everything at at uh, Wembley Stadium. Mm-hmm. So we um, we get to downtown. We check in our hotels Friday, and we don't have a curfew Friday night. So the whole team goes out. The whole team goes out. Uh, we have to split. 
we had to split up because the place that we went to, the club that we went to, they couldn't let us all in. They couldn't let us all in. And so fast forward, half the team went to another spot, the other half is here. We, we get back to the hotel, we, everybody's fine, we get back to the hotel. The very next morning, we had 8.15 meetings. We get down there, I thought they canceled the meeting. It was half the room. Oh. I'm like, what the? And it was so negative that coach didn't even bring it up in the next team meeting, like before the game. He didn't even bring it up, it was so negative. He didn't bring it up. We had a guy who, we had a guy who missed the entire day. They missed the entire day. And um, you gotta tell me who that was. Huh. I joke, I kid. I yeah. joke, I kid. Missed the entire day. Another guy we thought got kidnapped because we couldn't find him in his room. We couldn't find him anywhere. <laughs> we uh, we go to the game, and at halftime we're losing twenty-one zip. I remember. And we uh, we looked at each other. We like, listen, bro. We can't let that happen and then lose this game. We can't. It can't happen. We pulled it together. You know, winning it by a field goal at the end by Matt Prater. Um, after a miss? At, after he missed it, but yep. it was a delay of game. Yep. They didn't run the clock off because it was a dead ball foul. They moved it back five more <laughs> five more yards. I, I'm looking at the Falcons' sideline, and they're trying to decline. I'm like, you can't decline. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but we end up winning that game, right? We end up coming back, winning that game. And when we won that game, it was a roar so loud in the locker room. We didn't talk about it, but when we came back, when we got back from London, and he put on that emphasis tape, and he had all the fines of everyone that was late. And the guy who missed it, I mean, the guy got fined like 30000 Damn. And it should have been way more than that. Sure, sure. It should have been way more than yeah. that, but he took it easy on him. Yeah. Yeah, he took it easy on him. But, but no, but hey, here he is. I'll tell you what, we're going to introduce him. We're going to introduce him to you when we come back. I told you we're going to have him on. He's a buddy of mine. He's one of the best in the business. Yeah. People are already making their Ziggy Ansa, Kyle Van Noy cracks at him. We'll explain to you why that is when we come back. Scott Bischoff joins us on Woodward Sports. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to Grow Green, the green standard for garden supplies here in Michigan over the past 10 years. We offer the best gardening and lawn care products and have an extremely knowledgeable staff to help you create your dream garden or make your yard the envy of the neighborhood. Shop the store located in Whitmore Lake or online at growgreenmi.com. Delivery and curbside pickup available. Grow Green, making Michigan greener one grower at a time. We wake up every day with a choice. Keep going down the same unfulfilling path or start chasing the life we dream about. At Northwestern Tech, we want to make that choice easier by allowing you to keep working your job while training for a real career in heating and cooling. And our hands-on program is only 10 and a half months. So getting in the field and building a career and actually waking up with a purpose could be a lot easier than you think. Northwestern Tech, the HVAC school that works. All right, so what is up? Welcome back in. Tuesday morning, Belegian and Bell. Again, we have a special guest coming on at 12.15 today, uh, Janoris Jenkins of the New Orleans Saints. Uh, he's going to give us a breakdown of uh, what we're affectionately calling the Joyke Bell Bowl. Mm. The Saints and Bears getting together, NFL playoff action. A guy that knows a little something about the NFL, knows a little something about the scouting game, the combine, and, and taking a look at some of these guys kindly joining us here uh you've Hi. heard him you've seen him uh i'm glad that he was kind enough to come down this morning um he's a friend of mine too so yeah we, am, am i allowed to say that sure you're not embarrassed by that joy well, usually I'm, denies knowing me. i'm trying to you know i'm trying to hold in my my uh disdain for what you just said but you know we'll, we'll get over it we'll move on scott bischoff joining us uh here hi on legion and bell hey uh first of all i'm gonna get this out of the way right now i'm gonna i'm gonna tell a story and we've talked about this play a little bit uh take me back to the combine in 2010 down in indy and how uh everybody was talking about this uh running back that that most people mispronounce his first name how do you say that first name? Hmm. This kid that went to Wayne State and uh, this this play that he made 
uh, down at the University of Indiana. So it, I wasn't at the combine, but but what it was was um, there's this whole thing about measurables, like you know how fast is like how fast is an Alabama receiver, right? Like right now, people are talking about Devonta Smith, about concerned about his top end speed, which is ridiculous, right? Like it's he's fast. Is he like? rare fast probably not but it doesn't matter to to his game but so there's some things that are like measurables that you can see and you made a play where there's no there's no stopwatch or measurable on the planet where you can you can evaluate what it was and it was the extra point where you tracked down that player yeah jt owens and it was i mean it's it's one point and a lot of guys would have just mailed it in and right right but how do you think anybody would be able to measure your speed when you track that guy? It's like the DK Metcalf play from this year. I was going to say that. It's, it's the exact it's same. exactly what it was. End zone to end zone. You Absolutely. catch him. He caught him a little bit, you know. Mine was like right at the nick of time. <laughs> I caught him at the one yard. <laughs> but it was still the, clo- the ability right. to close over. You ran for 60 yards and then tracked him down. Yeah. How can you measure that? Right. You can't. Right. right. So there's some things on film where you just have to – it is what it is on film. Um, I bring up Devonta Smith because there's a, there's another player at Alabama who I think is Waddle. Yeah, I, he is so fast, and it's like, um, have you seen the movie Arthur, mm-hmm. where where uh, they're looking for the apartment building, and and one of the one of the features of this apartment building it, is it has I O L, which nobody knows what it means. So the, the the super gets up there and he turns on the light with the light switch, and he says, "Look, it's instant on lighting," and it's like, well. It's just a light, but Waddle's speed is like that, where it goes from he's stopped to top speed, and it is instant. Like, mm-hmm. you can see it. It's just, it just happens. Like, he goes yeah. from um, – and they line him up out of the slot, so they give him, he's got a two-way, to go, a two-way go to to win in his routes, but he's so fast, and he's so, and he's so sudden with how fast he is, and that's why there's a little conversation about uh, Devonta Smith right now. Because when those guys played together, Waddle was more explosive and, and had more production in the first four games. But yeah. you wouldn't think that because Smith might win the Heisman. But so there's measurable, the whole measurable thing. And, and some of it's a little bit like how much value do you put into like a con- – I don't know what you as a player put into it. And I'm sure yeah. you were, you know, you were interested in what your times were. But there's just no way in, in a lot of cases can you measure how fast a player is, how football fast a player is. Like, you know – as an example, does it really matter how 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 what a, a defensive tackle runs in the forty? Really. Aren't they really in a lot of trouble if he's got to run forty yards? Yeah. Offensive linemen, same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could say that the vertical jump and maybe the broad jump and some of the other some of the other you know like the shuttles and that kind of stuff is more right. important. But measurables are what they are. So how do you feel just, about the bench press? A lot of it is yeah yeah, mm-hmm. and then you have to bring up like how long are a guy's arms, how short are a guy's arms, right? Mm-hmm. So. The pterodactyl, um, right? I hear so much about the pterodactyl. Like, they, well, his arms are so short. He's like a pterodactyl. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a, a measurable that comes up all the time. It's You're going to hear that about Rashawn Slater, the Northwestern tackle this year. It's gonna, there's going to be a conversation because he's sub 6'3". Does he have the arm length to be able to play tackle at the NFL level? And if you can move your feet and you're really technical with your hands, I think you can. But so you were, you're going to hear some of that stuff. But the, what were your thoughts about the combine? What, what did you think of it? Did you, how much value did it hold for you as a player? I didn't care about the, I didn't care about the combine. I got invited to it and I went and, I mean, but I, think, I, think like my ta- I think my filmed? tape speaks for itself. Yep. I think my body of work speaks for itself. But, and, I think that I, and I think the way that they can go into a combine and devalue a player because it's 40 time. But on film, but on film, he shows that regardless of how fast or his type of speed, he's still making plays. And so for a guy to go to the, the combine just to get devalued uh, in a 40, I'm better, you better off not even running a 40 and just say, hey, well, you know, pick me up. And what they try to do to you is they try to scare you. Like they play this mind game with you to where you go there. We had um, a GM from a team, I'm not gonna say who it was, he came into the um, he came in, he came into the room. He spoke to all the I think it was all the running backs or all the offensive players or something like that. And he said, "Listen, 
We're the NFL. We don't need you. This is what he said. We don't need you. Y'all yeah, do need us. We're the players. What are you talking about? You do need us. But, you know, but okay, continue. Now, you have a lot of guys. And you kind of know what he was getting to. You have a lot of guys who come here and think they don't have to run the 40. That's fine. That, and, like, basically trying to put it out there as if we're going like, that's going to devalue if you don't run it. And, I'm like, look at my body of work. I don't need to run the 40. But I ran the 40 anyway because I had been training to run the 40 because I wanted to kind of show I've been training and I'm, I'm not slow. I was still slow. I was four six guy. <laughs> but but still. can you imagine on this planet thinking that a guy who runs four six is slow? Isn't that funny? Yeah. It, it, it's like in, in the NFL, it might be considered slow, but because everybody's fast. But yeah. that's not slow. No, it's not. But it's crazy. I got to interject ever, because we have a, we have another pro athlete that's chiming in, and much like you, Joyk, I got a chance to see you before you made it. I got a chance to see Darren McCarty before he made it. Right. And, oh, McCarty's a slug. McCarty's a slug. The dude was a sniper. I saw it with my own two eyes. I that, watched him put up mad points. You know what's crazy? I that, test, baby. I I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. That a guy who didn't have the same body of work can go into a combine, run a faster 40, and get higher value than a person that's really doing work on the field. Like, I, I don't get it. Now, that's how we, mistakes are made. They, they're made that way. You have people who really don't do their homework. And they just look at paper. Oh, this is on paper. And they don't they don't watch enough film. They might watch some. They don't watch enough film. And those are the guys who don't need a job being a scout in the NFL. I, I do not like those guys. Some of it's what kind of film are you watching, too? Like, one of the things I think it's really important is to watch an entire game or multiple games, not just highlights. Because some of it's situational stuff. Like, if, you, if they're watching highlights, they would have saw your play, right? But they might not see... Um, How know, that for, affected the game. Sure. Or they might not see that, all right, here's a guy who takes the ball, you know, off tackle and they're winning the game and they just need a timeout. And instead of running for the extra 12 or 15 yards, he could have got, he got the first down and laid on the ground and ran out the clock, which that's smart football, right? right. That's, that's really, that's good football awareness. They might not see that kind of stuff. And so, the, so is there value to those kind of plays? Yeah, there is. So, so not all film is created equally and, and, you know, um, it, I don't mean it to sound like, you know, some people are watching good film and some people are watching bad film. It's more what you value, right? So I think, I think uh, getting back to the combine, it's just a small, a very small piece of a, of, a, of a large puzzle, but the puzzle is consisted of mainly watching football. You know, it's film. And, want, and that's wanna, really what it needs to be. I want to bring up a point because you and I talked about this a couple of years ago. Um, Tease Tabor, right, out of Florida. Tease Tabor was a guy everybody talked about. Everybody talked about he's just a step slow, okay? Tease Tabor is in the NFL. Were, his issues in the NFL, and, and you yell at me if you disagree. His issues in the NFL were not because he was a step slow. I, I mean, they just weren't, Scott. They're, what, like, seriously, how do we quantify on the field? Joy, you're running 4-6. Another guy's running a four five six right yeah H how do we quantify that i i'm i'm within reach of you i can i can dive and grab your legs yeah. whatever the case may be so it's funny so many people go back to well we should have known with teases times scott correct me if i'm wrong his issues in the nfl were not because of that step slower i don't think they were i think it, in his scenario i think it's more scheme related for what what they were asking him to do he was more of a zone type player where he want so he he was a player who wants to who wants to keep his eyes on the quarterback doesn't want to have to turn his back and then find the ball right he wants to look at the quarterback stare at the quarterback's eyes and let the quarterback kind of tell him where the ball's going to go and then he wants to get out of his pedal and get to the ball so he comes to Detroit where they ask him to play in press coverage where they're asking him to turn his back and then make plays on the ball and it's just a different skill set. It's, di it's a different thing to do. Is, will he work as a zone corner? I, I mean, you know, there's a long way to go, but like a player like Marcus Peters is very similar. If you ask Marcus Peters to play man coverage and turn his back on the ball, you're negating everything he does well. Where with Tease, his instincts are off. I mean, his instincts to find the ball are, are through the roof. It's more, don't ask him to turn. You know, it's, it's, it's just, a it's not a strength of his game. So. Asking him to then, then do that, I think, is just poor. It was just poor uh, understanding of what Tease did do well, right? So you're asking him to do something he just can't do, 
and then surprised that he can't do it. We're going we're gonna to talk about the top of the NFL draft board in just a few minutes, and, and uh, hopefully uh, we're going to be talking to this guy a lot in the next few months here on, on Woodward Sports. He's Scott Bischoff. Make sure you follow him at Bischoff underscore Scott uh, on Twitter. You know what, Joy? This is a perfect opportunity with him here to talk about Jared Davis because Jared Davis was graded yeah. as a first-round pick. Mm-hmm. Jer- Jared Davis, Scott, I know you and I privately have had this conversation. I love the guy. He's got a great attitude. He he puts in the work. He is a physical specimen. Every year, Joyke, again, here's that eye test. Every year you look at him, it's like, well, how can you how can you have less body fat than you did the year before? I mean, <laughs> he is really put together. It's not happening on the field here. Dog chasing cars yeah. is an analogy that people can throw. What is the issue? Is that scheme? Is that limitations? What when when you look at a guy like that, what how are the lines misusing him? Um, I, I don't know that they are mis, misusing him. Uh, I mean, I, asking him to play in coverage is is problematic. But I mean, it's the first thing you said, you can understand why they drafted him. If you just talking to him, he exudes football character, right? So the way he the way he talks. Now you would understand it a lot more than anybody here does. But to me, it's just he's super super aggressive. And there, is, there are times when he will get out of his gap because he's so aggressive, and then he's not necessarily getting helped with the, with the defensive lineman in front of him. If you, th- if you just think that everybody's responsible for a gap, right, and, and his, his initial read on a play is that he needs to come forward and to say, let, let's say, his B gap, and he's there, but the defensive tackle gets washed into, the, into that gap too, and now the running back is running backside on a play it almost looks like he's made the mistake, but who's, who's, who's responsible for the gap? Who, you know, is somebody getting washed down the line of scrimmage and now they're, you know what I mean? So it's, it's not Joy, always for a reason over there. It's not me. always his fault. No, no. We, we had this conversation yesterday. Cause I told him like, it's like a running back uh, without old linemen. They can help make us look good. Yeah. Same thing for linebackers. That D line can help them look good. Like with Steven Tulloch and we had DeAndre Levy, we had Terry Whitehead. Um, Travis Lewis, those guys. Uh, but you also had Indomitian and Sue. You had Sue. And you had Fairley. Nick Fairley. You had, you had uh, C.J. Mosley. You had Jason Jones. You had Ezekiel Ansa. Uh, we had, like, a lot of guys. Ansa. Oh, <laughs> swoon. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we have guys like that that's, that makes it easier for the linebackers, right? Yeah. You know, that might, you know, soon go need two linemen on him. Know, make it easier for the linebacker to you know to, to fill that gap or, or whatever it might be. So it's um, it's not as simple as just saying he gets out of he yeah, gets out it, of position. It's not, it's, yeah. There's a synergy between uh, between the front seven and when when there's when when your defensive lineman can't anchor is getting kind of pushed all over the place. He's got to guess as to where he needs to be, and that's what it looks like. And, then, and it's and not when, all his fault. And when he's guessing. He's wrong. The, the running back is watching him. You got it. And wherever he wherever he go, I feel. So he goes there, I go here. He goes there, I go here. Um, it's what it is. He's not going to give himself – I, I got to give everybody credit why he said Ziggy Ansa swoon, and you're not going to give yourself credit, so I'll do it for you. Um, he told everybody like a year beforehand – there's this kid at BYU. He's sick. He's he's going to be. It was January of, it, before the draft. Oh, I was. remember that. Yeah, I, yeah. And it literally, he he was he was on my radio show at the time, and he goes, "This guy's going top ten. And again, he's not going to say it, so yeah. I'll say. It. There yeah. were people that are going, "You're out of your mind." How did you see? It? How did you know that? What did you What did you see? What did you see? That? Okay, so I was at the Senior Bowl on the field watching Chris Kachurik and Jim Schwartz. Uh, coach him in the O-line, D-line drills? Were they the coach back-to-back years? Yeah. No, no, no. No. No, no, no. They, were, they were my coach in the senior ball in 2010. Absolutely, yeah, And in yeah. 2000, he came out 2000 with 13? 2000, yeah, it was, it was 2013, and, yeah. I was, and it was, I was super close to when it was happening. So first rep, he comes down and, and he lines up. I'm going to think, I think it was over Xavier Nixon. I might have his name wrong, but he was an offensive tackle who was an All-American from Florida. And Ansa, they snapped the ball, and Ansa just – around the corner no problem super easy and it's like ah, that's pretty impressive he's obviously super explosive so now nixon knows all right this dude's quick and fast so i now have to overset to get out there so he oversets to get out there on the second rep and ansa bull rushes right through him and beats him that way and it's like 
So he does this for five minutes, right? It, over and over and over. So then, <laughs> you know, so Kachurik is... Um, Chris, yeah. The, the mouth, right? The language yeah. is just awesome. Yeah. If, you're, if, you, yeah. if you don't mind well, the swearing. Put the paws on him. It's, <laughs> put the... The, Put the meters on the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the language, What's right? What's up, Chris? <laughs> so you can hear all this stuff. So then Schwartz is now – Schwartz is at midfield, and he sees he, – it's like he's monitoring this, and he sees this happening, and then he starts coming to, up the field, and he is screaming everything you could imagine about, we don't want to show anybody any, any of this stuff, so stop it. So Kachurik then tells him, we want you lined up right over him. Don't line up wide and just beat him that way. So he, the rest of the week, he looks kind of like, you know, can't get off blocks. He's struggling. But the Lions didn't want to show anybody what he was capable of doing. So in the game, they let him go. They let him line up wide, and he went off. And it was just like if they're paying that much attention to the things that he does do well, and they're telling, you know, if they're expressing it that they don't want to show it to any other teams, right. they obviously really like him. So then when you go back to the film with him and you watch how raw he was, but the things that he could do, yeah. it was ridiculous how was good raw. he was. He was yeah. raw, but I mean, when I you, love his story, the bro. physical traits are, or the traits are just incredible. Well, and that's why we have a running joke between us. That's why we laugh. I mean, I mean, no disrespect to the people out there that are putting together these mock drafts right now, but I have no other way to say this. You don't know shit. I mean, that, that's, that's where we're at right <laughs> it's, now. It's so true. Really, you, I mean, right now, <laughs> And, and that goes for people like me, okay? We're reading these mock drafts. If I wrote up a mock draft, would you read it of this afternoon? Of course I would, because you know I'm a loser. I'm a mockaholic, <laughs> I do. right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there eating and digesting something that I know is no damn good for me. Outside of your smoke ribs. Right? And yeah, I mean, other, other, than, other than the fact that I just need it, and, and that's, that's the issue that I have. And so we, we have this running uh, gag joint where – we take a mock draft from like this week, right. like this week, the mock drafts that are out there, and there are tons of mock drafts out there, and we compare what this mock draft looks like to the actual draft. And it's amazing how, how many misses there are. Some guy that isn't anywhere on the radar that ends up going in the top 10. There's going to be more misses in this year's mock drafts than ever. Well, just, be, just by the nature of what this year is. And, and it's crazy. With all the quarterbacks, mm -hmm. and Scott, I've never seen a year where I have seen so many different opinions on some of these quarterbacks, right? I, I mean, it's yeah. a, 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 like Lance is the one guy. I mean, to me, it's, it's like you have some guy saying, this guy's a stud. You have some guy saying, you don't draft him. You don't cautionary tale and all that stuff. I mean, that's what's crazy this year. How is the top of the draft going to work? And what does that mean for the Lions at seven? Well, um, so it's, this is going to be a tough thing because I, I kind of feel for whoever comes in here as a GM and as a coach because there's really no, there's no really good way about going about this, the current makeup of this roster, especially at the quarterback position. And, and we all know the Jacksonville job is going to be the most coveted because they have a ton of cap space and they're going to draft Trevor Lawrence, mm -hmm. right? So, but what do you do with Stafford? That's, that, that's like, if I were running things, that would be the first thing I would be asking a, a, a candidate to be GM is what's, what's your plan there? What are you doing? Because that's going to drive everything. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know that there's a good answer for this, but I don't know how many rebuilds a general manager is going to get. And if you're sticking with Stafford and you're, and you're rebuilding right now, at some point in time you will be rebuilding again because he is aging and he's breaking down a little. More than a little, so so how so how do you um, prevent that? You break down when you take hits. So how can you prevent that? Do, how do you prevent Stafford from breaking down? And yeah, how do you how do you stop I, that? I think you trade him and let it be somebody else's problem. But if you're doing that, and you're this is for sure rebuild. Absolutely. One, so sure. that's the question: 1, is, Do we think it's a for sure rebuild right now, or do we think that there are a few a few steps and a scheme away on defense from? from being competitive on offense if everything goes well. And the, the answer is on offense, they're, they're more competitive than, and I think they have some pieces, but on defense, I don't, I don't know that they are close. I, I, you know, I mean, I don't know on the defensive line, who do you have right now that you would say is a piece that a GM would think, all right, that guy helps. That guy is a piece of, of what we have going forward. 
Um, at linebacker, same thing. Who do you have rushing the passer? The one good thing is that you do have some makings of a secondary if, you, if the scheme changes a touch. But I'm of the mind that they're rebuilding, period, right now, whether, whether it's with Stafford or without Stafford. That's just that's where I'm coming from with it. I could be convinced that they're not. But, um, I, I mean, I think you're rebuilding multiple times in the next five years if you keep Stafford. And, and to me, that's almost a failing model. But I also understand it's very hard with Stafford because of what he is as a player and how good he is when he's healthy and, and you know, and when the offense is rolling. It's just how long before they're competitive – how long? I mean, they set records on uh, for for their ineptness on defense this year. Historically bad. Yeah. So how close are they to be to to being to challenging and and and, and saying yeah? How we, close or how far? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good yeah. question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it's. Am I uh, right to think as highly as I do about a Quora? I, 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 there's something there. Which, which one? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. No, but you, I mean, to me, there's something there. I think we, we've seen it. There's something there. And Are you going to pay him? Because he's an unrestricted free agent. So you have to pay him. And he's, he's kind of, I don't want to say he's a one-year wonder because that's dismissive, but his production does come from one year. Um, you, you, some of that will be dictated by whatever scheme, whoever, whoever they bring in to be the coordinator wants to, wants to run. And, yeah, I just think that you need you need multiple pass rushers, you need multiple interior defenders, you need a coverage linebacker or two, and that's just that's starting. You got to think we had that in fourteen. We had I know. that with and, Tahir and, and Andre. We had you that. had everything in fourteen, yeah, he and the you guy still by the name of Kyle Van Noy, by the way, too. That was a, that was another. It's just the BYU just, thing, and I, and and it's happening again. Yeah. Just gonna it stay is. healthy, but went to a place where he blossomed and. But that's a, that's a scenario where I think they asked him to do things that he just wasn't effective doing. You know, in college, he, he played a certain way, and he was great. He was incredible. Um, I, don't want, I don't know what it's what – it, well, I don't even want to go there. Um, he was awesome at college, and, they, and when he came here, I'm not sure that Terrell Austin had a great idea of what to do with him, but asking him to drop away from the line of scrimmage wasn't it. Right. I mean, it just wasn't he just he wasn't effective doing those things. Mm -hmm. Let him threaten the edge and and play between the gaps and get the ball. But he just wasn't asked to do those things, things here. And then the the core injury, I just I think the core injury in year one just crushed him. Mm -hmm. And it sucked his his, uh, you know, his not it just his confidence. I don't think he played with much confidence here. Obviously, he did in New England when they were asking him to play a certain way. But. That, that's from the outside. I don't know what was happening inside the room. Uh, I, I don't know the oh, no, I'm not. I'm not in that room either. Well, you were. No. You were. I, I mean, wasn't in that room. You, you, never, you didn't play with Van Noy at all? No, I said I wasn't in that room. So I don't have Oh, I got you. Yeah. I got you. I got you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. They don't have those. You weren't in the of, linebacker room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would, no, so, or the defensive room. So when we have our offensive meeting, they have the defensive meeting. We really don't hear what goes on in the defensive meeting. But did you feel like when they drafted him – there was excitement about what he was yeah, as a player. Was. Of course, it was. And then when you saw him doing what the Lions were ask, were asking him yeah. to do, it was like, that's not what he did at BYU. No, not at all. By any means. So there's a lesson there. It's yeah. don't ask a guy who's really effective doing A and B to do X and Z. And then and then and then it comes into play, right? When you have you need help at a certain position, you need help at with a, with, with, at a certain position. And you ask someone to play out of position, right? And you have people who go who who do that, and they blossom in it. Mm-hmm. You have some people who do it, and it just is not their thing. They and it hurts adjust. the players Frank around Ragnar. them too. It hurts the player. It hurts the player, and it hurts the team. Frank Ragnar. I I I, thought, I said it then. I say it now. He can talk about it better. You have what might be the best center in the game, and and for a period of time. You asked him to be something else. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Scott, can you As a rookie, that? they asked him to play guard as a rookie so Glasgow could play center. It's confusing. Now, now why, do, why do you think they had him do that? I have no idea. That, that, was, that was a mystery to me. I got into that with a few people on the broadcast. I today. think that they thought Glasgow was going to be a much better center than guard. But even then, you drafted a center. Right, mm. he's a center. Let him play center. 
I don't know why they did it. I really don't. It's one of the confusing things. It's, it's a confusing... Uh, it's easy to say this now because they're not here, but some of the, some of the choices and decisions they've made have been confusing. Um, we don't prioritize the guard position, but you paid TJ Lang. And then you let Gra Graham Glasgow walk after he played at a pretty high level and then use the third round pick that you traded up for for Jonah Jackson, who looks like a fine player. But there's just so much confusion about that position. You drafted a center who's a really good player, made him play out of position as a rookie and failed so that you could play Glasgow as a center where he failed. And then the next year, Ragnall was good as a center and Glasgow was really good as a guard. It's confusing. It's almost like I, just, I feel like it was um, – at times, they were listless and just didn't have much of a plan other than we need to fill these needs and let's fill them with whatever players we can bring in and let's hope it works. And it just, even, you know, even in this draft, the most recent draft, uh, taking a running back early the way they did and then moving up for Jonah Jackson, giving up some of the picks that they gave up and then <laughs> backing that up by taking a guard in round four because he was so highly graded for them that they couldn't pass on him, that's confusing. So the Ohio State guard was a, is a really good player. Nasty. Sure, and, but Stenberg is too, mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. He's got to rein it in a touch. But it's just a confusing message that we don't value the position, but we're going to take one in rounds three and four, and they're polar opposites as players. It's just it's just very confusing, and it's there's confusing moves that they've made, you know, all around. It's now, not like everything's been bad, but there's been some situations where it's uh, been very confusing. I've heard that when they're having these meetings, we'll be in the room with the team, and then when it's time to make the decision, which everyone wants to be in there, he would <laughs> dismiss everyone from out of the room and staying there with this one guy. And they'll make the decision. Who was this one guy? I don't know. I don't know. Just, uh, one, was, it, was it a coach? Uh, no, it wasn't a coach. Okay. Interesting. Right. Yeah. No, uh, so, and this is just a rumor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, you know I, I, got, I, got little, I got little birdies everywhere. You know. I get it. It wouldn't yeah. surprise me. Um, yeah, and, so, and, I mean, that's well, not I the end of the world Ryan either. Calhoun. <laughs> that's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is – just like looking at their roster right now, like summarizing it, I don't know if you're a GM coming here and you're looking at the pieces that they do have, you know, um, and I don't mean it to sound dismissive because we they're NFL players. They're all NFL players and they're incredible at what they do. I mean, you know, some of the best people in the world at the things that they do and, and I'm dismissive of them here. It's ridiculous, but there's just not a lot on that roster where you would say these are the 10 pieces or eight pieces that we have going forward that are kind of like cornerstone types. There's not a lot of that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, Stafford is like the guy and what, and that's a, that's a conundrum. I don't know what, I don't know what, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear what the answer is for me, but I'm not in there making that choice. So it, you know, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter what I think in, in terms of that. Um, quarterback league, we all know it. This is going to be another year where we see it. Uh, Scott, legitimately, we're talking about what? Seven quarterbacks in the first round, five early on? Is that, I mean, is that, is that crazy to think that? I don't know if it's five. Um, I'm assuming you're including Mac Jones and Kyle Trask yes. in round one. I would not. Okay. I do not. I don't think those guys are, I mean, if they are, they're very end of round one types. later you know hey we're the green bay packers we're yeah. gonna take one because we can yeah and that, you know teams love that fifth year option for quarterbacks they, they love to have the fifth year control but i think there are four trey lance is going to be a leap of faith of leap of faiths just because he didn't he had one game this year and and coming from that program uh but from a trade standpoint he's got it all he does it's just he's raw and he, he needs more time period i think there's four there's four what I would consider uh, top end quarterback options, obviously Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson from BYU. I think I might have his babies I, if that was a possibility. I, okay, all jokes. <laughs> Scott, I didn't know that you felt that way about him. I like I. Well, I you know, I thought about it. We all together. I, I 
love that. I love that guy. He he does things. So if you so I if you were to look at Patrick Mahomes, I know it already sounds like hyperbole, but I'm not talking about Patrick Mahomes right now. I'm talking about Patrick Mahomes scouting reports from when he played at Texas at Texas Tech. Again, not Mahomes today, but Mahomes when he was coming out and you just replace Zach Wilson's name or Mahomes' name with Zach Wilson, the reports would read eerily similar. It were, no, they would. He does things outside the structure of a play. He makes throws that you think, huh, how did, how did that happen? What, and it's like um, the whole shortstop thing. Quarterbacks playing shortstop and knowing that I don't have t- – I'm turning a double play and I don't, ha- I don't have a lot of time to set my feet. And I don't ha- I'm not throwing – the ball with the perfect arm angle. I just got to get it there. And however I got to get it there, I got to get it there. Wilson does all those things, but he also has incredible footwork. So you can see him, you know, shotgun snap progress. His first, let's say his first read is to the left. And when that's, when it's not there or he doesn't like what's there, his feet have already drifted to the middle of the field before Mm -hmm. his eyes get there. And as soon as it's open, his feet are ready to make that throw. So, so he's making some of these tight window throws because his feet work, his, his feet work, his footwork is advanced. So you see the discipline with his feet, and then you see the arm strength and the ability to put the ball into certain spots where he understands where the leverage of a defender is. He might understand that the safety's got the middle of the field. So I've, I've got to throw it more towards the numbers and give my receiver a chance. He does all those things. He, I mean, he just does. He is... He's had such an incredible season. And, and the way I look at him is that BYU tailored an offense specific for him. So it's not difficult to see what you would need to do for him in the NFL. It's right. It's all right there. It's, it's right there. With some other players, you do need to project. You do need to – what it, like Justin Fields is one of those where what exactly would you do with him at the NFL level? See, I love hearing this stuff, Joyke, because you know what? There aren't enough guys out there that talk about that stuff, and you as players, you live that stuff. So I love yeah. hearing you talk about it. I'm only going to understand it so much, okay? All right. But but when I hear you talk about it, Orlovsky does a great job talking it up and stuff like that. Four quarter, yeah, for sure. Yeah, those, those are the th- I love to hear things like that, you know, because my eye test looks at that guy. I love I, – honestly, I didn't even know you were that – I go crazy watching him. He's, he's silly good. But hearing you guys talk about that that technical stuff that you live, I mean, to me, you can't give me enough of that stuff. You love it. I love it. It's, so the technical stuff is where is how you win. It's where you win. Right. So it's uh, like for certain positions, like for my position, I know like the small things. Yeah. Um, it's small things that I learned from Fred Jackson that um, when you, I mean, it's certain, like he would really teach, he coached me up. All right, he coached me up. He was awesome. Oh, uh, I knows mean, how much I love Fred. I, I, lo- I love I Fred. Love and, and you don't, he doesn't get enough respect that he deserves. Uh, but the way that he taught me the game, um, when we get down um, inside the 10, don't line up a seven, line up a six and a half. The field is shorter. Um, when you do your check down, don't go to five yards. The field, the, the field is shrinking. So go three yards, get the ball, get around quick, get in the end zone. Um, when you run, when you're running your 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 arrow routes, turn your head, you know, around a little bit quicker because the quarterback has to get the ball. He's gonna go through his progressions a little bit faster. So these are the things he's teaching me. Um, um, if if there's a um, if you're lining up in the home position, if, and for people who don't know what home is, just behind a quarterback out of eye formation, if they call a play um, and it's an audible and there's an audible and uh, or we give them different options. You know, you get two calls. And um, if they change it to uh, like a dive, um, you you kind of, you line up in the back. I got to get right here, you line up. You act like you don't hear it. I'm like, what was it? And then instead of going back and line up at seven, you just, you know, take a step back. And now you're at six and a half, you're not at seven. That makes a big difference. That make a huge yeah. difference when you're in, when you're, like when you're at the goal line and and you have to time this block up perfectly and it's timed up perfectly at six and a half. But if you are lined up at seven, you'll miss the hole. It's certain, it's, and when you're in college, you might be able to get away with that type of stuff. But in the NFL, the, the, error, uh, the window of error is so much smaller. See, so, he's talking about things that people like me have no concept of. 
None. That's why I love hearing you guys and talk it's, it up. It's great. You yeah. know, like, uh, we can talk about footwork and all these things all you want. But at the end of the day, it's the small stuff and it's, it's the little thing. details that makes you successful. And sure some is. of that stuff does not, you know, you, you need to understand some of that stuff. You know, like for, with quarterbacks, for me, there are, there are things that you know and there are a bunch of things that you don't know. So I tend to want to avoid conversations about progressions and reads and those kind of things. Uh -huh. Because how do I know what his coach is asking him to do? Uh -huh. Right? Like I don't know what the progressions are for, for Ohio State's offense. Uh -huh. I have no idea what they are. So why am I going to kill the quarterback for maybe not going through progressions when he's doing exactly what his coach is, is asking him to do? Like with Fields, with one of the things that Fields does, he'll stare down his primary read. Stare it down. And, and he'll hang there way too long. Well, a lot of times he ends up coming open. Yeah. Right? So that's when some of those deep throws happen is because he stayed on him so long. We got about two minutes. Janoris Jenkins is going to be joining us, of course, from the New Orleans Saints to talk about the Joint Bell Bowl. Uh, Scott Sewell from Oregon, uh, Oregon, uh, no <laughs> doubt about best tackle in the in the draft. I mean, it's not even close, right? I, I, to me, it's not. There's a lot of, there. I, I shouldn't say a lot. There's going to be some conversation just because I think people love to get into the. He's been penciled in as the number one tackle for too long, so we need to have a conversation about. A, a different guy. Stupid. I don't know who it's going to be. Christian Derrissaw is good, but that. you know, Sewell is big. He's 330 plus pounds, and he moves like a a very a much smaller player. Um, Sewell is is the number one. He's a great. Player. Micah Parsons out of Penn State. I've seen his name attached to the Lions linebacker. Lord knows the Lions need some help at linebacker. Uh -huh. What are your thoughts on him? He's a really good player, and he's better in coverage than than anybody they've had in a while. But it's still an off the ball linebacker, so you're, you're you have a premium pick. I don't know. You start with the trenches. I just I don't know why you'd be taking a linebacker at, with with pick seven. I because it, it's not. You know, I mean, you you have eleven guys on defense, and you need really good play from all eleven spots, but. That's not a premier position, and it's not a it's not an ultra productive position. So to me, that's he's a great player, but it's just not here not here right now. It's a, that feels like um, that feels like uh, almost like taking a, a tight end early, where it's almost finishes your your yeah. offense yeah. as opposed to a building block. And you hey. said it; they really need help on the interior there or a pass rusher. You the man, Scott, the man. always Scott. a pleasure. We're, we're going to uh, catch up really soon. You and I, Appreciate I talked to the Scott. boss in here, Chad My Johnson. Pleasure. There's Chad out there. Shout out to Chad. Uh, he wants to do some draft shows, so let's do it. All right? Okay. All right, fantastic. I'm in. Scott Bischoff kindly joined us. Thank you us. for having yeah, me. I no, appreciate it. For coming another, on. another guy. Stick, awesome. stick around. We're going to talk to Janoris Jenkins. Uh, Janoris Jenkins is going to be uh, joining us yeah. any second here. Of course, on Woodward Sports. And you know what? I just realized I need my headphones, don't I? Yeah, so we, I can hear Janoris. Uh, do you have an extra We're, we're going to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. You want to take a quick so break? So then that here? way you can get your headphones. Quick break. Yep. We'll come back. Come we'll back. talk to Janoris Jenkins. It's the Belegian and Bell Show. Don't go anywhere. Janoris Jenkins from the New Orleans Saints. Next, right here on the Woodward okay. Sports Network. Welcome to Grow Green, the green standard for garden supplies here in Michigan over the past 10 years. We offer the best gardening and lawn care products and have an extremely knowledgeable staff to help you create your dream garden or make your yard the envy of the neighborhood. Shop the store located in Whitmore Lake or online at growgreenmi.com. Delivery and curbside pickup available. Grow Green, making Michigan greener one grower at a time. We wake up every day with a choice. Keep going down the same unfulfilling path or start chasing the life we dream about. At Northwestern Tech, we want to make that choice easier by allowing you to keep working your job while training for a real career in heating and cooling. And our hands-on program is only 10 and a half months. So getting in the field and building a career and actually waking up with a purpose could be a lot easier than you think. Northwestern Tech, the HVAC school that works. So what is up? So glad you could join us. It is the Woodward Sports Network. He's Joyke Bell. I'm Sean Belegian. This is Chad Johnson from Lady Jane's. You know this guy. It's wicked awesome. What's up, Chad? Hey, good to see you, boys. Nice to wicked see you, awesome. my good friend. To see my uh, I'm going to say it publicly, uh, Chad. This everything that's happening 
is because of you, and we thank you. Seriously. Well, you say it too much. It's really us. It's a team effort. It's a lot of people. You know how it kind of works. It's Shut like. Up. Shut up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can get the politically correct, but the facts of the matter is someone that can, you know, put a team together like the Lions are trying to do, and you can have camaraderie, and you can get along, and when we're off the sure. air, we're high-fiving, we're joking, and it's really – even though I never got past high school football, right? At the end of the day, you learn so much from the game. You learn friendships, you learn teamwork, you learn giving more than you've ever given for somebody else to achieve something. And, you know, the camaraderie, and I, you know, I know we're gonna talk to Rabbit in a second, one of my best buds, but, you know, as far as the team, when I look for a head coach, I want somebody who can move a whole room. I can go and get Wade Phillips to run my defense. I can go get a good offensive coordinator. But my head coach has to be able to vibe with the homies. They got to be in the locker room. They got to be high-fiving. They got to care. They got to show the emotion, you know. I, between me, I think Caldwell was a little too sweet and Swartz was a little too tough. Somebody right there in the middle of Caldwell and the Jim Swartz is kind of, you know, what I think, you know, the team needs. But... I wish I was making the decisions, but I'm not. Culture. <laughs> Everything comes back to the word culture, and I yeah. know Joyke agrees, and I know D-Mac, who was watching, uh, agrees. And, and the culture that you speak of, that's kind of the way it is here. When You get here in the morning, what's up, dude? How was your show? Hey, what do you guys got going on? Yeah. You know, you walk out, you say hi to not only the employees working for Lady Jane's, but everybody working here. Yeah. To, I'm a culture guy, and you know what? It's fun to come here. We're yeah. all having a blast talking about things we love. Man. Yeah, I think that's the most thing, you know, and just the glass, whether we're in the studio, we can see all the way to the coffee shop. You know, everybody's, you know, doing real good, you know. But as far as back to the Lions a little bit, once they got rid of Diggs on defense and Diggs was kind of like their guy who kept the team together, he was kind of like the guy that would stick up for the coach but yet keep the players kind of, come on, let's do this, we're a team. And once they cut Diggs, it was over. And if you look back and you see once they got rid of Diggs, you know, from Slay and the team and just like, he was their captain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they made him the captain. I mean, you're talking the coaches made them the captain, but the problem with him is he had a little hip injury and the doctors may not have given good information on his hip that he would be able to stay healthy. And you see what Diggs is doing out in Seattle. I mean, he's a difference maker. And that's what you need on defense, difference makers. And that's the reality. They don't have no difference makers on the defensive side of the ball. We were just talking about that with Scott Bischoff. Here, here's a guy, you bring in Kyle Van Noy. And, and, and Kyle Van Noy, to watch him go to New England and fit like hand in a glove, dude, it rips my soul. Forget about my heart. My entire soul leaves my body. I'm tired of watching guys do that stuff, man. It's frustrating. I think, again, last time I was on with you guys, I spoke about a little bit about, I think, how Bob Quinn ended up losing his job, was really trying to make Matt happy on defense and have this linebacker do four things, have this defensive lineman do three things, have this cornerback do three things. And next thing you know, when you didn't build it properly, when you have a guy that can do three things, he usually can't do none. And at the end of the day, it didn't work out like the Patriots. No. It just nope. did not. Are you no. going to say anything or are you just going to sit there and <laughs> stare at our ass? You know what's funny? I was sexy you telling you to look in the camera when you talk. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do better than that. I'm right no, at you. Right All that talk. Bro. All <laughs> that talk. <laughs> <laughs> Had to have it, man. Hey, don't leave me out, though. I don't leave you, bud. Don't leave I love you, bud. <laughs> For real, though, you got to. You're in here. You get so, you know, going and you're talking. You get going. You're having fun. You going. Next thing you know, it's like, hey, everybody, how are you out there? You know, Chad, to your point, and I told Joy this, I'll never forget the first day of camp of the Matt Patricia era. It, I mean, you want to talk, it was culture shock. We're, we're, and I'm sure you've heard the story by now. We're a minute in. And this guy is beat red on the middle of that practice field. You know it better than anybody, Joyke. You can see him out in the middle of the practice field. He is beat red, and he is beep, 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 dropping F-bombs. You, I mean, you went from the culture club of, or, or excuse me, the, the, the country club of Coach Caldwell to all of a sudden Captain Redass in the middle of the field berating grown men. Right. That's not a good first impression, man. Yeah. Um, I have never had that happen um, to me on the team. Well, at oh, home you have. We've told you to sit had, your, had, your ass down in, at home before we have. You said what? We've told you to sit your ass down at home before. Nah, when I set your ass down on that ping pong table. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So, um, 
<laughs> oh, there he is. Look who we got. There he is. Oh. <laughs> oh. Rabbit, let's see you, boy. Ladies, uh, you gotta put your hand in the ponytail. Oh, you gotta put it in the bun. Oh, yeah. Let's <laughs> go. What's good? Janoris Jenkins of the New Orleans Saints kindly joining us here on the Belegian and Bell Show, Woodward Sports. Uh, first of all, Janoris, appreciate you taking the time, man. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. How y'all doing? Fantastic. You know, th this is interesting because I was talking to uh, your boy Joik about this. You know, sometimes we in the media are fans. You know, we, we think it's it's a totally different scenario in a playoff week. But Joik was telling me it's business as usual. We all know what's at stake. It's just a regular business week. How's that been for you? Uh, man, it's been good. I've uh, been taking care of my body, um, relaxing, getting off my feet, you know, just watching film. Um you know what time it is. It's go time, man. Everybody got to turn it up a notch and just ball. Hey, hey, Rabbit. Um, I want to before you hold on. Let oh, me get my okay, question. Go ahead. I told go you ahead. relax. Uh, relax. I'm, this well, ain't my you're, show, you're, so go ahead. All right, relax. Real quick. All uh, right. So we're, I was talking. I was talking to Sean real quick, and uh, we're trying to think yeah. of how you came up with the name Jack Rabbit. Now I, ha I heard a couple rumors. Um, <laughs> he said he think because you're kind of fast. I I caught wind that. You got the name Jack Rabbit, but everybody calls you Rabbit because you used to chase rabbits during for your training. Is that true? No, nah, that's actually not true. Um, I was in college. Uh, I went to college early. Florida. So I left school, you. high school in like January. And, um, you know, I ain't, I ain't know no plays, so I'm playing spring ball. Um, I ain't know no plays. My coach just threw me out there. And I was like making plays. I had like probably like four interceptions. Um, spring ball. And then um, one day we get in the film room, we watch a film, and he's just like, man, you moving quick, you moving fast. You moving like a little jackrabbit. But I ain't know what I was doing at the time, you know what I'm saying? I was just playing off <laughs> spring ball, two ball, get ball. I ain't know, I, ain't, I really didn't know, understand cover two. I was just out there just playing, but I was playing fast. And I was just making plays, and we got in the film, like I said, he told me, and one day he just said, boy, you moving like a jackrabbit. And after that, I just ran with it. You ran with it, huh? <laughs> he did. Yeah, but we, well, do, chase, we do chase rabbits from the muck, though. Okay. Hey, Rabbit, I want to talk about um, the first team you ever played for. And the first team Rabbit ever played for was the Saints. Um, he wore number 57. He was a linebacker <laughs> and a check. running back. <laughs> And now he finds himself <laughs> on the New Orleans Saints, where Ricky Jackson, yeah. you know, played for the Saints, and all goes right. circle. What you think about that, Rabbit? <laughs> That's crazy. Because <clears throat> I actually wore number 57, wore number 57 because of Ricky Jackson. Um, it was like Pop Warner, bro. I was like eight, my, about seven, like seven years old, 57. I had 57. I played O-line, linebacker. I was about to just smash it, like, just, I, think, <laughs> I thought I was Ricky Jackson. You feel me? And oh, that's great. Just to be able real, to just bud, say I made real. it and be with the Saints, man, it's, it's a blessing. For sure, for sure. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Pahokee. This is a, a, a town that's um, in the middle of Florida down. Tell them about um, the book, Chad. Let, let me just name some of these players that come out of this small town. You're Anquan Bolden, Parnell McPhee, Antoine Smith, Alfonso Smith, Bill Bentley, Richard Ash, and the Rabbit. He's the king of, of, of the muck. Damn. He's okay. the king of the muck. What they got in the water down there, Janoris? You say the what? <laughs> Something in the air, he says. Something in the air down there. <laughs> Is that what they have oh. in the water? I don't know. Alligator. Hey, Rabbit, so um, last year last year you um, came on the Saints towards the end of the year, and you, you came in, played well, um, played good in your first uh, playoff game, forced fumble. Um, this year you were able to go to, you know, a little bit of camp with COVID. You've been with the team the whole year. You guys seem like you're um, gelling a lot better this year. What's the difference between last year coming on the team towards the end of the year compared to being with the team the whole year? Uh, just more just more time with each other, um, just being around each other, getting to know each other, and just a vibe, man, you know, whenever we can due to the situation. Um, 
and just learning each other, man. Learning how how each other play, and just being together for a long time. You know, um, it's all about bonding. And I feel like we've been bonding very well um, all through the season. Um, we're just gonna continue to bond and play ball. You can tell. You can tell that they're playing at a higher level. I mean, you guys are ranked number four defense in the NFL. Um, and I tell everybody it's about the culture. It's about that team camaraderie. Um, and it was a, I think you build that brotherhood, right? And so back in yeah. um, the early ages, when they used to go to war, they used to try to put brothers or uncles and father and son together because they felt like they fought harder that way. And so when you build that camaraderie right. and you guys build that brotherhood, they, they they play they play for their brother they you know when somebody get hit a late hit you know he doesn't have to get back up because one of his teammates is already in the guy's face you know defending his teammate and uh, they can tell like when you guys are playing the way you guys are playing I, I, that's the type of ball I love to see like um, yeah somebody man. get tackled of course man you know, we we all pick them up. Fun. Yeah, when we, we all watched football fun. this year yeah, we saw that we we saw how the guy got um. Um, spat on it in a game and then you see if you're friends with Rabbit you know you're going to be safe anywhere you go with him because you saw my boy jump on his back and just give him the, basically the rattlesnake. That was right. And give him a goddamn rattlesnake. You know, uh, that's yeah. just how it goes. So we always know we safe when Rabbit's with us for sure. <laughs> Hey, Janoris, talk to For me real. about Sean Payton. You and Joyk have something in common. You both you both had an opportunity to to you know work under Sean Payton. This is a guy, he waited his turn. He was the hot name, and now he's been there, had a lot of success. What sets Sean Payton apart? <clears throat> Man, one of the best coaches I ever played for. Um, just as far as just understanding players, you know what I'm saying? Being a coach's player to where, you know, you guys can be who they want to be. Have fun. It's all about business. But make sure you're having fun. And I think Coach Payton, he understands that as a coach. And I think that's why a lot of guys that come through here, that they really respect Making us dizzy as shit. he understands <laughs> being a player. <laughs> Hold that damn phone straight. <laughs> Don't move that phone, rabbit. Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> The hell are you trying to do, My man? man. My man he said he feel like he watching Blair Witch Project. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Denar's real quick. Yeah. <laughs> hey, real quick, bro. Um, Sean asked me earlier, like when we went to the playoffs, we kept it like the same schedule. We didn't really switch off. Do you guys make changes when you guys go in the, uh, go in the playoff mode? Do you guys change the schedule? Do you guys keep the same schedule, um, just like the regular season, uh, doing everything you? I guess you guys did during the season. You're doing that in the playoffs as well. Yeah, you keep the same schedule, man. Coach Payton understands. He knows. He keep the same schedule and just let, let us go out and ball. For sure. Yeah, again, today, Tuesday's their day off. So, Rabbit, we talk, you know, just as boys all the time, and we always talk about how the Pro Bowl and stuff is sometimes a popularity contest, and you always kind of stick to yourself and, you know, have a small circle. But I always joke with you of – you know, the league is showing that you're a pro bowler by the cash they paid my boy. <laughs> that big cash they paid my boy. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, at the man. end of the day, you know, just working so hard, coming from nothing, coming from the muck, seeing your family, seeing your friends, being able to put your family, your babies, your children, Gina, um, mom, dad, in a situation where everyone feels safe. Kind of tell me, you know, how, how, that, how that feels to you as a human, as a man, as, you know, a son, as, you know, a leader of your family. Oh, man, it, it feels special, man. Um, just getting to this point, um, knowing that I'm mature as a, as from a young man to a grown man, um, knowing that I was raised right, knowing, you know, everybody made mistakes, get over the hump. Um, but at the end of the day, you got to be a leader. You got to lead your kids. You got to lead your family. And uh, most important of all, you got to give it all thanks to God. And um, I'm happy. I'm excited. Just got to keep going. Sure. Hey, Janoris, I got to ask you, you know, uh, we have a rookie cornerback here out of Ohio State. I know you're busy during the year, probably haven't had a chance to see him, but Jeff Okuda, highly touted. 
you're a guy that came into the league. Everybody knew who you were, knew your story, knew what you could do. How difficult of a position is that to play? You know, you often hear people say, man, you're on an island a- as a rookie. Uh, to people out there that are already sitting there trying to diss a Cuda or diss a young cornerback, talk about that transition from college ball to the NFL at cornerback. Oh, man, it just, at the end of the day, I look at it as football is just football. Um, mm. Just do what you do. Um, you don't have to change. Just come in, do what you do, and um, everything will take care of itself. Uh, the way you prepare, just prepare how you always prepare. Um, and just go have fun, man. Like People try to make football as if it's so hard when you're coming into the league. But at the end of the day, you've been doing this for your whole life. Just come in and just understand that now you more accountability is on your shoulder. I agree. But at the end of the day, it's just football. <clears throat> the thing with Rabbit that he's always had, guys, is... Hold on, I had another question. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah. Want, I want to piggyback it's off It's okay if you interrupt. Go ahead, it's your show. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, now, when you came into the league, who was that guy in your, in your DB room that you learned a lot from? <clears throat> Uh, from each team, you, I mean, uh, I mean, you was with the Rams, you were with the, the Giants, I mean, now you're with the Saints. Now, what guy did you learn the most from? The guy that I learned the most from, um, I would say his two guys, um, Cortland Finnegan and Dominique Rogers Um uh, nah, That's my guy. Both of those guys talk yeah. me a lot. Both of those guys, I learned a lot from both of those guys. Uh, Cortland's my my young homie. He he's out of the league now, but he's got uh, smoothie bars and stuff. We got to get Cortland on the show uh, Ooh, here. Oh, that'd Cortland, be good. Uh, Cor- Cortland, that'd Cortland, be good yeah, to get, get him Cortland on the show. show. Yeah, yeah, Cortland's my let's guy. Talk, let's talk about that play yeah. against Miami. <laughs> I'll get Cortland on before I leave this week. All right, <laughs> uh, Rabbit. That's funny you said that. I never knew that. I never knew that. Uh, you know, you took a, a couple things from Cortland, but um, the thing with Rabbit and he, you know, he doesn't brag too much. He's just real low key dude, no. but. If you talk to his friends, when he was eight, best player. He was beaten 13 years old. When he went to high school, hands down the best player. Went to college, best player. Pretty much every team he's been on, he's been the best player. But what we always see with Rabbit, his one of his favorite sayings is no pressure. He don't feel pressure. So he when they, they work this weekend and they go to uh, this playoff game, this kid has no pressure. He's out there like this is just Sunday dinner with my family. He's been able to take the game to a slow, slow level, Sean, to where, like he says, he's like, I'm just going to work on Sunday. This is easy for me. Easy. Easy money. <laughs> easy for him. And I'm always going to brag about him. But again, he's 31, 32 now. 31, 32, and still getting over 10 M's a yeah. year. That just shows you the man. You that straight dog. <laughs> Tell hey, him. Hey, listen, listen, listen. Jack Rabbit, when he say you're getting 10 million a year, you can smile. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Talk about his loot. You don't right. like to talk about his loot. <laughs> no, man. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Hey, man, I just keep saying stuff I don't talk about. Yeah, First stuff yeah. I don't like to talk about, I just keep it where it's at. You know. Hey, you guys want to see it? It's on Google. Just go on Google. <laughs> hey, talk yeah. to me about Drew Brees. I mean, literally one of the legends that, that ever played this game. And, you know, we had a good uh, view of him back in the day at, at Purdue. And here, here's another guy, uh, Janoris, that everybody says he's too small. Everybody says he doesn't have the arm strength. Well, all those yards later, we're talking about a freaking legend. What, what do you see out of Drew? Man, Drew, first of all, Drew got that swag. Y'all might not see it, got but it. Drew got that swag. He got it. Like, that's the first quarterback back I ever played with, like, to where I seen, like, just come in the huddle. Not on no cocky stuff, you know what I'm saying? But you know how to walk. The way you walk, you can tell if that person knows, think he got swag. Drew Brees come in the huddle, rubbing his fang, rubbing his hands, just walking in with swag. And when he hit the field, it shows. Like he played with confidence. Like he understands the game. Like he know where everybody's gonna be on the field. Um, every day in practice, as he he could throw a curl, he could throw a comeback to the right side, but he gonna go through all his progress progressions every time. And it just every like, time. bro. I never saw this in a, a quarterback. Like, my quarterback, you know what I'm saying? No disrespect, but 
Drew Drew just he just he got more swag, more confident, and he's a great leader. You know, it's crazy that he sees that. So when I was there, he did the same thing. So he'll go through his progression. So say yeah. when he says it's a curl on the right side, he'll throw the curl, but he'll go through his second progression, his third, his third fourth. And bridge. fake throw him. And, and, and fake throw every one. And he'll check every one yeah. to know, okay, you guys are in the right spot. It's for him, and it's also, okay, you got, all you guys are in the right spot. And um, that's the trick I learned from him that – uh, that's how he remembers a lot of the plays or a lot of the concepts uh, by doing the by doing right. that, you know. So, um, and with that sauce he said that uh, that swag he got he got the sauce. I can't lie, but he used to get me hyped. He walk, I'm telling y'all, man. Uh, it's it's different. Yeah, it's different, man. It, uh, Just how you walk. Hey, rabbit. Okay. So you got a big game on. Uh... Go ahead. I tell y'all what. I tell y'all what. When we play this Sunday. Watch every time Drew Brees walk to the huddle to call the play. Watch how he walked to the huddle. Just cope, just 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 look at it, and then we'll have this conversation again after we do what we do. For sure. Mm -hmm. so, so, question: When you when you see that on the defensive side, what type of confidence do that get the defense? That build you up, man. That's your quarterback. Yeah, That's the leader of your team. That's the head honcho. So when when you see that, it's like, oh my God, we got a ball. We got a ball. We got a ball. See, that's that's the stuff that we feed off each other. Like offense feed off the defense. When defense balling, the offense yeah. is feeding off of that. We feed off each and other. And it kind of goes to tell you how a defense or a team can feel if you don't have a quarterback that you know that can help you win. Yeah. The, the 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 defense is demoralized before you kind of go into the um whole thing. <laughs> Darren's crazy. <laughs> D -Mac. Hey, Rabbit, um, today's Tuesday, so in the NFL, Tuesdays are your day off. Do you get your game plan for the game on Wednesdays, or do you guys already have your game plan? Not that you can tell us, but do you guys already game planning for the game on Sunday? Oh, yeah, man. Coach, shoot them out when? Yesterday, last night. Shoot them out, shoot you a text. Um, you know, nowadays we got iPads, so we use the iPads a lot. Um, yep. He shoot them out the game plan, and we just look over it until we get in on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I just don't see Trubisky testing you on Sunday, bud. We'll be bringing that home, that ball back home to Florida. Big facts. Hey man, ain't no pressure, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Four forty in the afternoon, uh, Bears and Saints getting together. And I'll tell you what, Janoris, uh, you may or may not know this. A lot of people around here hate the Packers. I'm one of those guys. Listen, I root for Satan against the Bears. So I'm definitely rooting for the Saints against the Bears. Uh, right, sure. It's going to be a good one. And a lot of people get Appreciate to see it. your personality now. I think there are going to be some Janoris Jenkins fans around here, too. Now, we're going to take it away from football real quick. Hey, man, I hope so. When you, uh, when you initially got to the Saints, how did you like the city? How do you how do you like New Orleans? Bruh, I don't to be honest, like I'm not a guy that just like go out and I don't I don't go out like like I don't I might go out <laughs> to eat, but I don't just hang out like hang out as people would think I do. As much as people would think I I, I hang out. Yeah. Um basically bro, I just go get food, come home. Um, go to the store with my that's family, what I'm come to. home. Like that's what I'm getting to. So what's your crazy. favorite restaurant? My favorite restaurant. <clears throat> um, mine is Niyaz. Where is that? Is that in the first quarter? That's it's, it's in Mid City. Uh. Oh, okay. Field. You coastal to like the fashion district, like by that area a little bit. I mean, I'm right in Mid City. Okay, I know where he's at. Cause my favorite spot out there was Mr. J's, right. the steakhouse. The steakhouse, yeah. I mean, <sighs> that was my I'm favorite. More like a <laughs> Chad. Tell him, Chad. I eat the regular, yeah. man. I would tell him, I mean, Red Rabbit's so much different. It's kind of like Miyakos. you know, people thinking who, who who I am just from your personality. But Rabbit's truly just a, a homebody family man, you know, has a very small circle and, you know, keeps the people that he loves close to him. And 
he ain't really out for the fame. It's not something he's yeah. really always wanted. He likes to stay away from yeah, the fame. Yeah, he likes to do his that. job and take care of his family and be with the people he loves. He don't really have time for, you know, people that he don't really know or don't love. He's going to spend his time with the people he loves and cares about. Respect. Talk about that. All the homies back at the crib. Huh? Uh, all the homies back at yeah, the crib. That's it. That's huh? it. All for right, sure. man. Um, our last thing. So do you? So question. You have a small circle, right? Did you do anything for your circle? Like yeah. once you made it, you got the bag. Like what do you do for your um, like what is it, business together, business ventures? They got rollies. You did. I mean, what was going on? What, what happened? No, I gave them. I, they're the legends. I they're the legends. Tell the them. Channel. I gave all my so boys got a chain, group. man. Like, a, uh huh. Like, uh, all us grew up together. Basically, we played football all the way through college. Um, so, like, we've been close since like age six. You feel me? So it's like, um, I made it. You know what I'm saying? I'm the the one that made it. So it it was only right that I show my love back because when I was up, they was there. When I was down, they all was there. You feel me? So it's like. That was like my second family outside of my real family, right. my homeboy. For sure. Yeah, the, the, the closeness that I see with yeah. him and the, the, the guys is truly amazing. I mean, like brothers, even though they're not blood brothers, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, Chad, I'm been out there with us, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, I'm allowed in the muck now. I'm, I'm, I'm allowed in the muck. <laughs> Ain't nobody giving me the, a matter of fact, I'll tell yeah, them a story. The, um, they're in like the championship game and me and Rabbit go down to the game and it's halftime and me and Rabbit, I think are going to go get a little drink. Next thing you go, come with me. He just walks right into the locker room like he owns the whole school, owns the whole, he's the head coach. <laughs> yeah, and we walk into the halftime of the game and uh, Rabbit just walks in there. I'm just sitting back and that's about it. But last question I got for you, Rabbit. If we had to put $100,000 on the line and we had to run a 40-yard dash versus you and Bill Dwight Bentley, who's going to win that race, Rabbit? No going to win? I'm going to win. <laughs> who's no going to win the 40-yard sure. dash between you and Dwight? I'm going to win. Rabbit going to win. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Dwight. You hear that, Bill. He's going to beat you, bud. You hear Dwight. <laughs> Hey man, yeah, good. Man. Best of luck. It's a pleasure chatting with you. You, you. I mean, you. You got it figured out. No pressure. I think that's something everybody Correct. should live with. And uh, this Sunday, we'll be rooting you <laughs> on against the Bears. Best of luck, man. Tell Drew I said what up, dog. I uh, appreciate it, my man. Thanks. All right, Rabbit. No I always love, love you, bud. Tell right. Gina I love her. All right, Janoris right, Jenkins, kindly joining us here, aka Jack on Rabbit, Woodward Sports. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, Chad, and I, I'm serious when I say this. My perception of what Janoris Jenkins was yeah. and my perception of what he is are in two different places. I get, because you know what? Here, here's the issue. And we're all guilty of this, yes. right? You, you read things, you see things, you hear things, and then you get a chance to talk to the dude, and it's like, that's a cool dude. Yeah, yeah. Like, he, that's a cool dude. Mm. Yeah, he really is. And, you know, again... Again, he's my little brother, so I'm always going to stick up for him. But the things that I see him do for his family, for us as friends, for, you know, just the people around him and what a great dad he is. I mean, people don't get to see this stuff of the athletes. You know, they want to hear that somebody beat somebody up or, you know, tonight Joik did something terrible. They don't want to hear all the good things Joik has done. They don't. Yeah, because we, they don't get the listeners. They don't get the followers. Yeah, you know you what, know? though? We talked about this, though. I, t mm -hmm. I told him that the media they feed off of that negativity yes. because it sells, right? So what they do is they, they build you up, they build you up, they build you up, and they put you on this plateau. To pound you down! <laughs> so that it's a bigger story when you fall, right? Say um, Kennedy got a DUI yesterday. That's not going to be in the media. <laughs> That's not going to be in the media. You know, it's, not, it's just not. But if that happened to, like, say, a Stafford or Barry Sanders or Calvin Johnson, um, guys who have great reputations in the area, I get that's going to sell, right? Yeah. It's going to sell, so they're going to put it out there. Uh, this is why I respect people like Sean, um, people in the media that if something like that was to happen, they can at least they'll at least call and give a heads up to Correct. the team before it happens. And so I, I have a lot of respect for people like that. And um, yeah, never judge a book by its cover.
Yeah, that's a fact. Because yeah. you don't know them. You, you get a, a minute clip. You don't know the things that the individual has done to better his life. And then again, when you better your life, when you come from nothing, you know, not to get into my story, I come from nothing, food stamps, you know, trailer park. It's like you were raised differently. So as you get older to 18 to 20 to 25 to 30, you're growing as a man. The shit that you've seen when you were 14, 12, and 10, and 16, some people and most people don't even see per se. So you, you, judging somebody that you don't know how their life was and, and, and the person they are. But again, I've been blessed enough to be around a bunch of these guys and now call them my brothers and my best friends. And they're better people than me, right? I mean, I'm a businessman. I'm a fighter. I'm a goer. I'm going to get it. These guys are humble, good men doing great You're things. You're also and, a philanthropist, too. Yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. But um, at the end of the day, these guys got a lot of great hearts and do a lot of great things. You know what's funny? The one thing that I have figured out, like being in media, and it frustrates the sin out of me because I've seen this um, for for many years, okay? And, and, I, and I'm somebody that overcame some things as well that nobody cares about. But um, one of my favorite stories is Les Mis. I love Les Mis. Seriously, not to get all culture on you, but I love Les Mis. Because it's a story of a, of a guy that effed up his life in so many different ways, but that light bulb went on. And it's almost like there's a segment of society that doesn't understand that what happened 15 years ago 20 years ago 25 years ago is not who you it's are it's not who today, you are man. correct that that helped make you who you are today and more often than not you learn from mistakes that you made For but sure. i i love that story I, I always love stories like that because so many times somebody wants to take a chad johnson and put him in that pigeonhole and it's like no man it ain't like that i that's the last thing i want to be is that guy i was 20, 25 years ago. And I think sometimes people forget that. You don't let that define you. That's part of your DNA, okay? You can't make it go away. But you can learn from that and become the anti that. You know what I'm saying? And then it really, how you deal with it internally, how you feel. You know what I'm saying? When you see Rabbit there, whether ups and downs in life, and now his life is amazing, he just always went through his life with his saying, no pressure. No there pressure. No pressure. He's going to go play Sunday, and oh, yeah. he feels like it's an eighth grade game in Pahokee on a not even a grass field, barely. Yeah. Yeah. Playing on some dirt. I've, I've been down there. I, right. I, seriously, playing on. That is amazing. I, like, seriously, as you were going through that list of players down there, my guy's sitting there shaking his head, you know, because he scouts all those yes. guys. It's amazing how, you know, there are little areas like that that just for whatever reason – Producing, and you see it in every sport, you know, because trust me, there's some little cities in Canada where you're like, well, how the hell did all you guys come from this little But city? even more are coming up. Like right now, Markevious Brown, he could have went to any college in all of America, Alabama, Georgia, Florida. And uh, last week, he chose to go to Ole Miss and go with Lane Kiffin. That He's is one of the best cornerbacks in the nation. He uh, left Pahokee his sophomore or junior year because he was so good. He wanted to go play at IMG. Mm. And uh, so he's going to go play Ole Miss and, you know, see how he does. But, again, even there's a lot more people coming up from uh, the, the muck. The you muck. ever been down there? I told him it's one of the coolest places I've ever been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to the muck. I'll, I'll, I'll probably go two or three times a year. Um, uh, their Friday night football, their games. Um, you know, me, me, me and Bill yeah. will go down there. And, you know, uh, yeah, no. They so love it. And the funny thing is, people in the league, I mean, you're talking 10 it, guys been in the league. Rabbit might have a bye week. And on his bye week, he's up in Pahokee yeah. <laughs> watching Friday night lights, man. So why do they call it the muck? Uh, they call it the muck because it's the best, um, um, like, soil to grow stuff. So um, it's kind of like mucky soil. So you put something in the soil, you could... Oh, they growing them. Yeah, they, <laughs> they growing. growing them there. You growing them. Uh -huh, that's you, what it is. It's yeah, in the soil. Yeah, it's the not muck. in the water. Yeah. Uh, I told you about Ole Miss, by the way. The place is awesome. It's one of the coolest places I've ever been. Uh, yeah, seriously, I don't know if you've been down there. I haven't been to Ole Miss. I, I, I know they're doing some Miss. great things with Lane for, down for, there. For that kid, for that kid to choose Ole Miss, I'm not that surprised because you have the combination of, of everything that Lane brings to the table and that campus. I'm t it's it's unbelievable. The Grove is one of the coolest places in college football to hang out. It's I mean it's really it, because you don't expect it. You hear about Florida, you hear yeah. about LSU, yeah. you hear about Florida State, you USC, know, and, UCLA, and then, right, right? And then you go to Ole Miss, and I was like. Holy shit! This is—I mean, this is for a college football fan. It was—it was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. I so, was so hold up real quick. The 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 bounce back to uh, uh to the poke what was it poke what? Where they from? Pahokee. Pahokee. 
Um, now, when Anquan Bolden goes back for those games, does he have, like, security? He has to be, like, escorted in? No. You know, Anquan uh, paid to build the gym there, put a million dollars of his own money God to build the gym in, uh, there. Um, as you know, he was a Walter, Man pa uh, Walter Payton Man of the Year, Anquan Bolden was, for the whole league. Um, he's been doing things up in D.C. to try to, uh, you know, help, um, you know, inequality. Um, no. Um, Rabbit's the legend there in that city. Anquan Bolden is the man. Isn't that funny? I mean, here's another guy, Chad. You, you, can, you can appreciate this. This has been a common theme because of Joyk. Anquan Bolden was the slowest guy on earth. Anquan Bolden can't play in the NFL. We saw him light us up week one when right? uh, Charles Rogers went, and he went for two hundred on something. Uh, yeah, I mean, we all remember that. We can, we can, you know, but I mean, that goes to show you those hungry guys. I mean, I love. Give me that hungry guy that that, that everybody's saying he can't do that. And an ex quarterback, the kid played quarterback yeah, at Florida yeah. State. Yeah. He moved a wide receiver, got a hundred and something catches his rookie year. <laughs> Since man. Crazy, man. Oh, man. Hall of Famer in your book? Anquan Bolden? No. Mm, I can't say Hall no. of Famer. I can Hall of good? Hall of, Hall of real good. Hall of real good. Hall of real good. Hall of real good. Hall of real Listen, good. I, I, I'm snobby, though, since you brought that up. Like, to me, even though Pandora's box has already been opened, it, the Hall of Fame, we shouldn't even have a debate. Like I say a name, Drew Brees. You're going to look at me like, what the? Of course Drew Brees is a Hall of Famer. To oh. me, if we have to have a debate about it, like that, I think it should be the Hall of Fame. We shouldn't let in very good players. We shouldn't let in, you know, guys that, you know, we could have a serious debate about. To me, right. it's no brainer, right? right? Like, you know, again, Drew Brees. If you want to be the moron that says Drew Brees doesn't belong in the, in the Hall of Fame, be my guest. But 100% of the population is watching National Football League and watch what he's done is going to say that. To me, that's what the Hall of Famer is. He's a Hall of Famer, but he's a bench warmer right, well, Hall of well, Famer because right, he's going to be about 10th in line. Yeah. Who, right. who are you putting first in the Hall of Fame? Are you, so you Frank, are you putting Frank Gore in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm making sure. Yes. One, one, I'm making sure. No, you, you know what, Chad? Because, because, you know, he's a uh, – now – is he a great running back, or is he a good running back that would been able to sustain? That has been able to sustain. That's a great point. That's great a, no, for that, great that, for some good time. That, real good for a while. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I, I right. think I think his longevity does play into it. I, th right. I think it has to play into right. it. Right, it does. Now let me say this, and and I don't want you to get mad at me. I'll take Aaron Rodgers over Drew Brees every day. Who cares if he at, gets mad at you? At, What's he gonna do? He can't do day. shit. <laughs> Who you? <laughs> Who cares if you get mad? Who you like, Drew Brees or Aaron Rodgers? I'll I'll Answer take, the I'll damn take, question. I'll take Aaron Rodgers. Oh wow, I don't. I'm not gonna get mad over that. I mean, okay. I would say I, I like, I, I like Drew, but I, it doesn't. His arm talent does not match Aaron Rodgers' arm talent. Aaron's sick. Aaron's yeah. sick. I, I, I hate him. I hate him with every fiber of my being because he's ripped out my heart. And you respect him with every being. Gosh damn it! That son of a bitch is so good. <laughs> It drives me nuts. I like I told you. Like I went through the same thing with Aaron that I did. And again, fun. and then again, who did he? And that's what I always come back. I always come back to this. Who was in the locker room when he got there? Yeah. Good. Good call. Another you guy. These, right. You yeah. have these guys that go into these situations with, with with guys who know the game, right? Who's been there before? Who can teach you the game? Things you might not know about the game that you're gonna learn from them. Things that I talked to you about. The things that Fred Jackson taught me on the field. Things that I won't be able to, I won't, I wouldn't be able to watch film and see that, you know. I would have somebody would have to tell me that. And then oh, he did do that, he did. And so it's things, it's things like that that you learn from guys who's been in the game longer, who's learned little tricks to the trade. I had this stiff arm that I learned that I picked up on my own that I passed down to my nephew, right? And it works every single time, every single time it works. And so. Uh, yeah, these are the things you learn, man. No, and Chad, to your point, I mean, seriously, as great as Drew Brees is at Hall of Famer, get in line. This era of quarterbacks has been disgusting. You know, I mean, it really, it's been disgusting. All right, I got one more for you before we go. Eli Manning. No. No. Eli Manning. No. 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 And it's weird because if you look at his body of work, he's got two Super Bowls. He's got longevity. He's got some numbers. And how much has that been on his on his um, back? I agree. I, I I say no. That is a I tough no. part though because they, they always say no. He didn't make the Hall of Fame because he didn't get Super Bowls. But now he's got two Super Bowls and he's still not a Hall of Famer. So in a lot of ways, I don't know if Eli can win too much. No, 
No, man. No. You know what you guys should do on one of your shows is go through the Hall of Fame and actually see who would be your starters. Take guys out. <laughs> like, who would be your starters? Who would you take out? Oh, give me the list. I'm, I'm plucking <laughs> guys left and right. I'm serious. I'm a snob. To me, three guys sitting together. Like, we all have to, like, look at each other like, what, are you dumb? Of course Barry Sanders is a Hall of Famer. You know what I mean? That's what, to me, that's what the Hall of Fame should be. I mean, that's, it, it should be. It's like they think they have to push seven or eight in a year, per right. se, when you shouldn't exactly. have to like, push like, that many in. somebody goes, look, Chad Johnson was good, but No, Deion Hall Sanders, yeah, for sure. He yes. Be, yeah. That's, yeah, yes, that's a given. Done. We're that's done. It. That's it. Cool. That but, but, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? There are some guys in there. Like, here, Drew Pearson is a guy really good in our age. Really good. Cries year after year. Cries year after year. He was a good player. He was a good player. Period. It might be the small things that you didn't see that will make him great. Yeah. It might be the small things. Yeah. I love. I love that. Well, it's funny. Keith said he's going in. He's a Manning. Oh, I think Eli Manning gets in one day. I I don't think he should because it's 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 turned into the Hall of Very Good. Yes. It's turned into the Hall of Good. Yeah. The Hall of Good. Yeah, it is. It's the Hall of You Or the Hall of Popularity with some numbers. That's a good point. Yeah. No, you brought and you brought that up to him. Oh, okay, you know, that dude, look at his body of work, man. He didn't need the Pro Bowl, I guess was my point there. When a team gives you almost twelve million dollars and you're thirty one, thirty two, you know you're doing what yep. you need to do. So the Pro Bowl doesn't matter to him. He knows he's one of the best corners in the league. And he's still doing it at thirty one. Hey, and it, as well as he played this year, he's still got Another two-year deal, whether it's with the Saints or someone else, he'll figure that out with his agents and stuff. But uh, and that, no, that's but uh, that's where it comes into play because he wouldn't want to do anything longer than a two-year deal. Because when you get at this point in your career, you want to continue to do these one-year deals. Um, and then the reason you want that because when the season's over, with, you can decide whether this is, is this the place for me or is there another winning team out there that just needs a piece at corner or a piece at that position that I can go there and win again and get another check? It's basically what happened checks. to him at the Saints. Because, yeah. you know, he, took, he yeah. got double-dipped a little bit with the Giants and then with the Saints, and then yeah. the Saints saw his action and they re-signed him to the yeah. you know, so, one year so deal. People who don't know what double-dipping means, I actually kind of triple-dipped. So my rookie year, um, I played for both the Eagles on that active roster. I played for the Colts on that active roster. And um, both of those teams went to the, went to the playoffs and then I got picked up by the Saints in the playoffs. So I was getting checks from three different teams. My one man. time you can do it, right? Huh? One time? What do you mean, one time what? I think you only can do it one time. I don't know if you can only do it one time. It's, it's, it does, I don't think it matters one time. It matter, if I played on a team for three to six games during the season on the active roster, then when they go to playoffs, I get half of whatever they get for the playoffs. If I play seven games or more on the team, and they go to playoffs, I get everything they get for the playoffs. Now, I don't know how much has changed with the new CBA, but I don't know if that changed or not. Okay. Um, and so I was on the Eagles for three active roster, and I was on the Colts for five active uh, games, and then I was on the Saints for the playoffs. And all, every team made the playoff. Somebody asked Calvin Johnson. Yes, period, end of story. Even, even with a smaller, smaller career, yeah. Calvin Johnson's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. When, when you can look at a guy's career and say yeah. there was a span where he dominated, absolutely dominated in the National Football League. I use Terrell Davis as an example. Terrell Davis has a small body of work, okay? Right. But it's not his fault. Gail Sayers going way back in the day. Billy Sims. Yeah, Billy, Billy, absolutely, <laughs> period. Right. Hall of Fame, done. We're Julio, done. All right, this era, Julio Jones. Yes. Yes. Okay. Just because I agree, he... I agree, I agree with that. Because even, hold up. And the reason I say that, I'm not saying it because he's Julio Jones. I'm saying that to say this, that within the span of Julio Jones and Calvin Johnson being in the NFL at the same time, he had more connections or more receptions from Matt Ryan than what Stafford and Calvin had. Well, they were but, saying. But people didn't know. People didn't realize that. People didn't know this. Yeah. But they had more receptions together than him and Calvin and Stafford. Have you guys been picking these games on the show, like this weekend and stuff? Will you guys pick and tell us who you like we and are this weekend, point definitely. spreads and shit like that? Maybe help our, have our listeners make some cash. Yeah. Maybe you can help these listeners we, make we some talk, cash, Joy. We, we talked about it already. Did you watch the show yesterday? We talked college. We talked point spreading in college. I was traveling yesterday, but I had to come up here and yeah, hang with you guys. Yeah, I know you didn't too much time. 
Oh, boy. We won't take up too much of your time. I mean, Jeff, thank you. Yeah, good group. Seriously. Proud of you guys. Love you guys. Good interview yeah. today. Much good love, stuff, dude. man. Yes, Anything I can thank ever you. do, always. Appreciate it. We're a team. Give me that. I'll bust that shit off. Yeah. Chad Johnson, <laughs> we appreciate him. Uh, My God. We're going to have some surprises like that. Chad has made uh, some pretty cool friends, and so uh, yeah. Chad's going to invite some of his friends on here. Anytime, Chad, you know that. Yeah, let's. Uh, I'll get Cortland on this week. Some of the tattoos you have of, of your hand when it says, blessed. Right there. It says blessed. So Very he actually blessed. got that when he met me in 2012. He felt like he was blessed. And so he got that. <laughs> Shit just got deep, didn't it? It's, it's up to my waist right, right now. That's the thing about Joyke. He is a character, funny, yeah. good man, good father. But yet, you know, when he's with us, he's one of uh, the people that always keep us laughing. So, uh, he does. you know, we'll keep getting it out of him so people can see the true him. No doubt. Hey, want to thank Appreciate my buddy Scott Bischoff for Scott, coming thanks well. for coming Scott, in, man. Yeah, Very knowledgeable. Shout out to well Kennedy. It's an exciting Kennedy, time of the year. Kennedy, Mark, you the Adam. shit, girl. Keep these boys in line. Who cares what they did before? She's You're in charge. All the time. You're in charge. Yeah. Just cracks that whip on <laughs> Shout out to Adam. He's running Most importantly, game. thank you guys for tuning in every thank day. Thank you, thank you, Love thank you. Love having conversation with you. We're yeah. only just starting here. Yes. I mean, seriously, we're not even a month underway. There's so much good stuff coming. You're going to have to trust me when I say that. It hasn't been a month yet? Yeah, it hasn't even been a month. <laughs> Feels like two, three days for you. I thought Joyke would come here and, you know, like once, the, once the, the day's over, he'd just get in his whip and head back. That boy just around here and talking chilling. to everybody, chilling, chilling with everybody, grabbing some food, we, we, grabbing we get, we get coffee. Ready, get, you know, support, supporting, um, was a house roast? Birmingham roast. Yeah. Birmingham roast. We'll be so back So question, tomorrow. when you put one in Detroit, what are you going to call it? Now we're opening our new one, Royal Oak Roast. Outstanding. That'll be Detroit Roast. Okay. we got some good things coming. We'll be coming. back at 1 tomorrow, or excuse me, 11 to 1. Don't forget, at 1 tomorrow, it's our barbecue show, so we'll be talking some barbecue. We're going to have some smokers out here sooner rather than later as well, I promise you. In the meantime, later. <laughs>